The Faux Wars, Book Two of the Ever Hero Saga, written by Jeff Pantanella, narrated by Ulf Pierkland. Prologue Your doctrines, Lord Regal, and your banishment. This was not the will of the Immortal Mother. Athenus walked a road of salvation, not just for the mortals, but for us all. Chow Hotze heard Attilia's melodic and passionate voice, though muffled behind closed doors. He could almost picture Lord Ragel's flawless face darkened with a frown, as the crowds of spectators inside the Cloud Course Amphitheater erupted with cheers of agreement or shouts of protest. Quiet! I will have quiet now! His voice thundered like a crashing wave and echoed off the pristine walls. The din of the crowd quickly diminished. This shouldn't be. It cannot be, Chow Houtze mumbled to himself as he scurried up another flight of stairs leading to an upper balcony. Today was the day the angel, Artiel, was to be sentenced for crimes against the laws of heaven. Never had a trueborn be brought before Lord Raquel's cloud court and treated in such a manner. A trueborn, and I'm already incredibly late. This is all Titus's fault, he thought. That great war horse can be so stubborn in his ways, and he never listens to reason, no matter how many irrefutable facts I give him. This will change everything, the small monkey said, and it is best to use only his short man legs, and not all four limbs, as was proper in such an august and magnificent place. It was a challenge not to revert to his ancestral ways when he was pressed for time. Using four limbs was so much quicker than two. Pardon me, pardon me, sir, Chow Houtzi said cheerfully and respectfully, as he darted past a group of slow-moving celestials, taking their time moving up the same stair. Each wore ropes of office of intricate design and pattern, with brightly colored sigils of turquoise, amber, and emerald. Their feathered wings remained furled and tight behind their rigid backs. Thin circlets of silver and gold wrapped around their heads and were decorated with jeweled charms that dangled just above their shoulders. Chow Houtze wondered what it would feel like to fly, to feel the air rush through the hair on your face, to soar and dive like a bird. Monkey, watch your paws, said one of the lower-born angels with obvious irritation. He twisted around with his back to the wall as Chow Houtze scampered underfoot. Hands and feet, good sir, Chow Houtze said, just like you. They will allow any riffraff into the cloud court these days. The high court should require an entry visa into Tanalum and block these unfavorable animal spirits from disturbing the peace. Keep them all in Elysian, where they belong. This is not their place, another said. His tone reeked of disgust. Let them soil the first level with their debauchery and unsupervised revelries. Block them all, I say. Elysian has become a droll nursery at best, unfit for the governance of the realms. Lord Regal must keep all human souls away from any agendas requiring important decision-making. His long, slender nose pointed like a ninth finger at Chow Haotze. You will be named in my complaint to the Chancellor Pinnacle, monkey. A third celestial was quick to comment. I cannot abide by these animal spirits. The stench of their former existence never leaves them. She was older than her companions and wore a purple sash around her waist, which complemented the light lavender hue of her robe and pink skin of her face. He thought the color combinations were quite pleasing. Chao Haotze would usually be disappointed to hear such intolerance, but today he was too preoccupied with getting a good seat. He dashed past the angels and followed the tight spiral stairs that wound to the upper mezzanine. The old stone walls reflected his small body, clothed in a bright crimson vest and cream-colored pants with swirling orange designs. His hairy feet and arms moved quickly, and he scampered over the remaining steps. He wanted to see it as much as hear the Chancellor Pinnacle's verdict. This was a critical case, and depending on Ragel's decision, it could have monumental repercussions throughout the Seven Heavens. Perhaps an unclaimed seat remains that will give me an unobstructed view of the court arena below, he thought, but didn't hold out much hope. 
as he opened the last door leading into the mostly filled upper deck seating. There, he said, and darted over the back of one row of chairs, then leaped between two seated celestials, using their shoulders to support his small, hairy body. Monkey! They cursed as he flew past their heads, but he barely heard their astonished gasps and harsh words of reprimand, distracted as he was with the incredible amphitheater. Amber sunlight poured through clerisory openings above the upper mezzanines. A sphere of polished gold suspended by invisible means spun hypnotically in the center of the arched ceiling's atmosphere. The sphere was a perfect measurement of 49 meters in diameter, with an additional glowing corona of 33 meters extending from its surface. A shimmering halo formed around the indoor sun, and no matter the viewer's vantage point, it was seen in the same way framing the golden orb. Chao Haozi marveled at this effect, but could never understand how it worked. It was a riddle for his friend Titus to decipher. The surface of the ceiling was filled with geometric designs, each flowing harmoniously into the next, cascading rays of sunlight washed over the silver inlays, worked into the perfectly shaped stone blocks, causing them to sparkle and shimmer. Today was a lucky day. Chao Haozi found an unoccupied front row seat between two elder celestials, most likely hailing from the second level of heaven based on their white gowns. He gave each a warm greeting and then peered between the gleaming golden rails to the court below. The immense chamber's inner shape was set as a perfect square with layers of circular terraces drawn down to the floor of the room. The upper mezzanines were filled with spectators and lower-level celestials jostling for a view, politely but assertively angling their way to the front railings. The lower mezzanine and mid-level balcony seating had reached capacity hours ago with the privileged celestials that held rank and office over the mere citizens of the realm. Only the true board, those celestials who had materialized at the beginning of all things, occupied the choice orchestra seats. They sat in stoic silence, garbed in golden robes of silk and cashmere. Bright sigils of power spun in slow clockwise circles above their heads, resembling floating crowns. The movement of the sigils mirrored the pace of the glowing indoor sun above. The chamber was full of boisterous laughter and commentary, as if the event was more for entertainment than a pivotal moment in the history of the seven heavens. Such a sad and desperate day, yet they all seemed to be enjoying the spectacle, the monkey thought as he scanned the faces of his fellow celestials. He could smell the ripe aromas of change in the air, even if the others could not. Never had one of their own been tried for transgressions against the heavenly realm. Would that he believed the Chancellor Pinnacle would find compassion in his heart and decide upon a lenient sentence if Artelia was found guilty of his crimes. The monkey inwardly sighed. He knew better than to hope for such an outcome. Far below, seven structures were raised from the floor and jutted into the center of the room like stone jetties. When seen from above, the negative space between each structure created an offset heptagram shape an auspicious design for such an area of purity and law. Each podium rose off the floor from polished stone stairs that ended in a circular platform, capped by a small rotunda. Ragel raised his hands to quiet the vast chamber. His wings unfurled into a great span across his back, mirroring his irritation at the disruption to his court. A quieting hush flowed through the chamber, as six heavily robed figures entered the great hall and walked to their respective stairs, and made their way to the end of each podium. Radiant mandalas of swirling sigils spun above their heads, and their preened and perfect wings were folded upon their backs. These were the oldest of the celestial lords, and had presided over the high court for millennia, and their judgments were final. Each of the six judges wore a specific color representing one of the six lower levels of heaven. Sage green was draped over the first judge, 
celebrating the innocence of a new soul's arrival to heaven. For each soul entering the seven heavens began its journey of worthy progress in the land of Elysian. Here the soul would be indoctrinated in the ways of heaven and enjoyed relief from all worry and despair. This was a happy place filled with verdant trees and golden meadows, where fresh souls could play upon the lush green grass and bathe in blue lagoons of mineral water. Ivory, for the second level of heaven, called Eden, and representing the pure of heart and the cleansing of sin. Chao Haotzi felt Eden was a dreary place, one of reflection and perhaps a touch of unwarranted guilt, as each soul released the last memories of a less than perfect life in the mortal realm. He wondered why these souls desperately clung to the grief of their past. They were free now. What perplexed him more was knowing mortals possessed the same power within them to cast away the burden of past failures and bad decisions when alive, yet rarely exercised this ability. True forgiveness, especially of the self, seemed to be a difficult or impossible concept for most mortals to grasp. The third judge took each of his steps with a proud swagger. He wore layered robes the color of bronze, which gleamed like a polished stones throughout the courtroom pavilion. The third level of heaven, called Arcadia, was for the passionate, kind, and just. Those who would fight for others in times of need were gathered in this realm. Legions of champions of spear, sword, shield, and lance, trained in readiness for any conflict with the evil spawn of the abyss. They were the protectors of the realm. The judge who wore the crimson robes with fiery specks of orange and magenta hailed from the fourth level of heaven, named Erewhon. Mystical powers of divine force manifested in the souls of this realm gifted by the righteous might of divine soul energy. The warrior priests of the seven heavens honed their magical craft. Their devotion to the immortal mother rewarded them with higher learning and powerful spells. The fifth judge climbed the opposite platform from where Chao Haotzi sat in the upper mezzanine. When the judge reached his rotunda, he gazed up at the spectators in the grand chamber. Chao Haotzi's keen sight saw sadness in the elder angel's eyes. His robes were of a strong vermilion, with lighter swirls of yellow interwoven into the fabric, showing that he represented the fifth level of heaven, called Canaan. The celestials living on Canaan were the caretakers and healers of all realms, though their influence in the mortal realm was less defined and non-existent in the abyss. Deep cerulean robes and a bright emerald overlace clothed the judge representing the sixth level of heaven. This realm was called paradise. It was a peaceful place of rest and meditation, filled with high mountain peaks and valleys carved by winding rivers. Yet long ago, those who dwelt here used their acquired mental prowess to assert control over the third and fourth levels marshalling for the forces of heaven and directing them on the battlefield where they thought best. Gold, representing the golden touch of the sun and all that fell under its glorious reign, was for the seventh level of heaven. The laws of order were written in Tanalum and enforced by Lord Raquel's protectorate. There was no higher office than the Chancellor Pinnacle and Lord Regal had held the office since its inception at the dawn of all things. His wings were composed of feathers from a thousand different birds, and he opened them with great flourish as he surveyed the crowd from the seventh structure. Then his ageless hands motioned that the final sentencing would begin. The air became still and quiet. The defendant, Artiyael, stood alone in the center of the chamber. He wore a simple white tunic and modest sandals. His wings and wrists were bound in silver chains, but he still held his head high. It appeared he had been treated well and unharmed. Nonetheless, two armed and armored protectorates were in striking distance if necessary. 
Their dazzling and unblemished plate armor sparkled in the bright light of the chamber. Chow Haotze noticed his ankles were also shackled and loosely connected by a chain. Why would so many chains be needed, he wondered. The angel dutifully acknowledged each of the judges in their high perches and ended with a respectful nod to Lord Regal. He stood defiant and proud. My Lord Regal, Chancellor Pinnacle of the Seven Heavens, I hope this day finds you well, Artiel said. His voice sounded of a sweet chorus of nightingales, as if nothing was amiss. Lord Regal moved quickly past formalities of greeting. Artiel, your trial is at its end. The charges brought upon you, as written in the Book of Heavenly Laws, have been spoken, and your pleas in defense have been heard. The six judges have come to bear witness to your sentence. The Chancellor Pinnacle's voice boomed throughout the chamber. Do you have any last words you would like the court to hear before the verdict is delivered? Artiel paused for a moment before speaking, collecting his thoughts. We must change, as the realms surely have changed through time. Our laws are fit for time long past. The mortals are children who need our direction and encouragement, not a blind eye until their undisciplined mind falls into folly. For when it does, there is nowhere else to look than the deep dark for answers. They need our guidance and love, not punishment in its most severe form. This was Aetinos' way. He, who was born of the realm of men, and a divine brother to us all in the seven heavens, knew this to be true. His message to us was clear, we have overlooked our children and left them cold and hungry in the wild, fodder for wolves. Lord Regal's face twitched at the mention of Aetinos. His knuckles whitened around the banister he unknowingly held so tight. A dull murmur flowed through the crowds. Many knew of the rift between the Chancellor Pinnacle and the demigod Aetinos. Chao Houtse wondered. How many knew it began from the unrequited love Regal bore for Lady Lyria? It was plain to see on Lord Regal's face that he still felt the prick of that rejection, and it stung. I do not deny my actions on behalf of the mortals, Artigail continued. My intentions were pure of heart and well-meaning. They may have conflicted with the words written in your book, but they were right. A murmur of unease rippled through the upper mezzanine. Chao Houtze was amazed at what he was hearing. He, too, felt a heavenly loss were too strict. There was no room for interpretation or a higher understanding of the immortal mother's will. But to speak aloud, such brazen disregard for the law in the high court was tantamount to heresy. The monkey scanned the mezzanine and lower seats, he saw others nodding in agreement. The way of heaven would be irrevocably changed after the outcome of this trial. Artilia waited for the crowds to simmer down. My final hope is that we will one day take the mortals into our divine embrace and guide them towards righteousness. Do not wait for the distractions of the undeveloped human mind to cast them astray before they have learned the truth. We all shall benefit if we hold them as sons and daughters now, rather than as afterthoughts to be culled and denied access to our paradise later. Lord Raquel contemplated the angel's words. You are correct. The mortal mind is a weak thing, and prone to temptation. But it is not for us to tamper with until their time has been chosen. They must prove themselves worthy to enter the seven heavens with no divine intervention. Such is the way of the immortal mother, and the doctrines she set to stone from the beginning of all things. Great balance must remain. The path of Aetinus was misguided. Your friend thought to change what was unchangeable, and therefore the immortal mother sent him away. Now he is nowhere to be found. His voice is lost to the mortals. 
But we are not here to debate wayward actions of a wandering fool. Monkey was at the edge of his seat. The silent tension in the courtroom rang in his ears like a continuous high-pitched peal. Regal was about to deliver his verdict. Artiel, you have committed unforgivable crimes against the heavenly realm and the laws of order that govern us. The will of the immortal mother was passed down to me, the first true-born of heaven, and rightfully interpreted by this office to protect our way of life. Thus chaos is kept at bay. You took it upon yourself to change the destiny of countless human souls and tampered with the mortality of their lives. Your actions have jeopardized the great balance, and therefore it is to my great sorrow that I must banish you. Henceforth you are exiled from the heavenly realm, nor are you allowed to exist in the realm of men. Such is your sentence. Chow House's mouth hung open in shock. He slumped back in his chair. How could this be? Banishment from the entire heavenly realm and forbidden from entering the mortal realm? This was more than a punishment for a misguided deed. The Chancellor Pinnacle was sending a message to all. Chow Houtze looked back to the floor and watched Atiyail led away by the protectorate. The condemned angel's head was low, and his wings slumped against his back. Then the seats before and behind him were filled with raucous excitement as the celestial stood to exit. Where would he go now? Chow Houtze wondered as he descended the crowded stairs. Be as careful as possible not to be stepped on or kicked. Outside the amphitheater, the sun was high in the sky over Tanalum, the seventh and highest level of the heavenly realm. Its golden light bathed the city of Asher in a warm, soothing glow. The sprawling metropolis sparkled in the sunlight. Fluffy clouds floated peacefully in the sky as the celestials went about their administrative affairs and duties of monitoring the fates of the frail humans during their short trial of life. Chow Houtze left the heavenly hall in a daze. He found a small, unoccupied wall niche along the shade side of a building and hopped inside the concavity. It felt like an upright coffin and just the right size for a little monkey's last resting place. The building's shadows stole the warmth of the day as he sat at the edge of the niche and put his wrinkle-skinned hands to his face and sobbed. He still couldn't believe what he had heard. Lord Raquel had given a true-born angel the death sentence. There was no need to wipe away the tears that ran freely down his furry face. No one could see him, and he doubted much that anyone would care. One. Kasai. Kasai held Desdemonia close to his chest. She stirred in and out of broken sleep. Kasai had fed her the contents of a small vial he had found in one of her many pockets. Thankfully, the healing elixir closed the vicious wound inflicted by Reese, who in truth was the succubus Sestra. Kasai shook his head in shame. I know, Des. You tried to warn me, he said softly. His thoughts returned to that ill-fated moment when the serrated dagger plunged into Desdemonia's back. How could he have overlooked such deception, especially when his inner sight showed him Reese was hiding such a terrible secret? How could he have been so blind? The chaos gate crackled with etheric energy and smelled of rancid snow. The surface of the portal glowed ashen green as vapors from Gathos escaped into the mortal realm. Its edges slowly and methodically ate away the floor melting away the stone slabs like hungry acid. The throne room was oddly quiet, and Kasai wondered if the entire fortress was empty. He looked for his companions. Baugr's lighting attack had ripped through the keyboard and Kasai and tossed them across the room. Their bodies lay scattered and contorted on the floor. Kasai was unsure if they lived. What did it matter? 
Soon, Barokia would be overrun by hordes of demons, and it was all his fault. Desdemonia moaned in his arms. Kasai let his water zindo flow into her. It was a basic healing technique he had learned years ago at the now desecrated and ruined monastery of Ordu. It would help to soothe her pain. What was it about her that had captivated him so? He felt awkward when she was close and desperate for her return when she was away. His emotions were not his to control when it came to Desdemonia. She was his dear companion and confidant. He looked to her wisdom in resolving the hard choices that came from such a perilous quest. Maybe just once you could listen for a change, stupid monk, he said as he gently rocked her body. And still, there was something more. Kasai yearned to be closer to this, but yet he pushed her away. He just didn't know how to express how he felt. Kasai was lost in thought for some time and did not say a word. He just continued to rock her back and forth. Kasai stroked her hair. He couldn't believe a beauty like hers existed in the world. She was his dark-haired angel. Yet at the slightest provocation from her, his fire zinder would flare and he would stomp off, feeling frustrated and angry. Nonetheless, even in such a short time together, he couldn't imagine his life without her in it. Destimonia stirred again, barely opening her eyes. Hello, handsome. Did we win? This mumbled softly and buried her head deeper in his chest and shoulder. We need to leave this place, Kasai said and fed her more of his water, Zindu. He didn't have the will to tell her he had damned them all. In a moment. Let me rest just for a moment. Kasai continued to stroke her hair. I'm sorry, Des. I should have listened to you. You were right. This was too big for me to do alone. Hmm, I'm always right, Des said with a sleepy voice. I was driven by revenge and pain, so much pain. I should have taken your hand and gone with you to the forest, where we could find peace. Still was peace to be had. At least we would be together until the end came. Estimonia didn't respond, but Kasai didn't notice. He watched another chunk of floor dissolve into the chaos gate. His hungry mouth started to consume the far wall. And if I went with you, well, I couldn't bear to lose you, too. That makes no sense. Kasai looked down at Desdemonia's body lying across his lap. What am I trying to say? I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. I was just afraid to lose you, too. Perhaps now that it didn't matter, it was easier to let go of unnecessary burdens and uncertainties. Kasai waited patiently for Desdemonia's reaction, but she had fallen into a deep sleep in his arms. Kasai outwardly sighed. I guess it doesn't matter if you know or not. Just rest. He realized the chaos gate would soon consume the entire tower. This was right. This was too big for him. This was the work of a king and generals and armies of fighting men, not one inexperienced stupid monk. He was no ever-hero. Kasai wondered what was left of the king's army after being overwhelmed by the demon horde. Thoughts of his battle with the demon warlord, Oziax, made him shudder. He looked at the palms of his hands. Those awful cobalt blue marks were still there, staring at him, mocking him for believing he was a hero. Kasai shook his head in disappointment. How did all of this come to pass? One minute, he was sweeping stones from the east wall steps at Urdu. The next, he was loosing his soul to a horrific infernal portal, which led to the abyss and consumed all it touched. And as a grand finale, he had just tried and failed to profess his love for a witch, whom he now held close to his chest. Kasai thought he should turn himself in and pay the consequences for creating such a dreadful thing. What else could he lose? His soul was already forfeit. At least he would not be able to bring any more harm to the world. He looked back at Des. He would lose her. Kasai wished things could go back to the way they were. He never asked to be the ever hero. Aetanos had wrongly chosen him. I don't want it. Do you hear me? Take it back, he shouted. 
The only response came from the hissing sizzle of a tapestry as the green fire burned it from the wall. Kasai shifted to his office box. He found a small chair cushion on the floor and used it to prop up Testimonia's head. He let her rest and moved to check on the keyboard and sigh. Thankfully, Paolo, Run Run, and Orin were alive. Her father was dead, killed by the demon Kalkaroth. Another vile act that Ku would need to answer for if Kasai ever found him. Kasai roused his companions and made them leave the doomed fortress. Carved artifices of demonic creatures fell from the ceiling as the fortress's foundation lost its structural integrity. It tucked Nancy Zida in his sash, and the fire serpent felt heavier than he had remembered. She, too, lamented the fate of Master Shogu. Another death Kasai had been unable to prevent. With a heavy sigh, he roused Desdemonia. Wake up, Des. It's time to go. As Kasai suspected, the enemy was gone. They had emptied the halls and abandoned the stronghold to the expanding chaos gate. Like rats fleeing a sinking ship, he thought. When they had exited the fortress, Kasai told his companions what had happened after Maugra's lightning strike. He and Des had managed to defeat the sorcerer, but Rhys had revealed her true form and betrayed them by driving a dagger into Des's back. In a desperate move to even the odds against Sekka, he used the magic-absorbing amulet Des had stolen from Kalkaroth. He placed it around his neck, and when the emerald stone within the centerpiece had touched his flesh, it established a bridge to Aetanel's soul, which opened the chaos gate. It was the worst thing it could have done, for that had been Sekka's plan all along. The devil had won. Now a working portal existed between the mortal realm and the realm of Gothels. I have failed you, possibly damned all of the three kingdoms. I am sorry. I was not the hero you had hoped I would be. It's okay, Kasai. You did your best. No one could have done better. Testimonia said. She gave his arm a reassuring squeeze. Orin sulked quietly. His eyes roamed to Kasai and then to Testimonia with a scowl. Something to say, Orin? Testimonia said. I can't hear you under that sourpuss you're wearing. Des, let it go. We're all feeling miserable right now. I have nothing that needs to be said at this time, Orin said. He turned to Paolo. Run, run, and I will scout ahead to make sure the way is clear. Paolo nodded, and the two warriors jogged ahead of the party. What was that all about? Kasai questioned Estimonia. There's one in every group. I'm surprised you, of all people, miss the way Orin stares at me with those shifty eyes of his. Does he? I had noticed. Estimonia just shook her head in frustration. Don't you notice anything? Ah, just forget about it. The party walked on in silence until they were rejoined by Run Run. Orion had found the way to the Stormwind Pass, and he would lead them from there. Eventually, the bruised and bloodied party descended the Horfrost Mountains. They found Eris at the edge of the forest foothills. The horses and supplies were ready. The young warrior was eager for news of their success. Iris, a word together, Paolo said. He took Eris aside before Kasai could say anything. Kasai could see Paolo was explaining the events that had unfolded. Eris listened intently and occasionally spared a confused glance at Kasai. He eventually nodded his understanding and returned with Paolo to the group. I'm sure you did your best ever, hero. Not all battles are won in the way in which we plan. Hope is not lost, for you are still with us and can fight again. Eris bowed his head. Iris, I'm sorry. I think Aetanus made a mistake. I am not the ever hero that was promised. Have faith, ever hero. The prophecy continues to reveal itself, for he shall find hope in his darkest hour. So you see, all is how it is meant to be. Eris half heartedly smiled at Kasai and turned to tend to the evening fire. Kasai wondered how anyone could have faith in him. They spent the early evening in somber silence. Desdemonia made use of the remaining sunlight to gather herbs and replenish spell components in the forest, while Palo and Run Run tended to the horses. Orin climbed a nearby tree to take the first watch. Kasai sat apart from the group and attempted to ease into a deep meditation. He closed his eyes and tried to be calm. His mind was filled with erratic and distracting noise. 
He struggled to concentrate, but could not balance his Zindu energies. His thoughts unwound like a frayed sea pennant being blown apart by gale force winds. Each tattered thought became an individual thread, whipping and snapping on its own. Instead of leading him down paths of tranquility, his mind stubbornly and repeatedly showed him the horrors of the past day. He did not have the strength or will to become realigned with a higher state of awareness. Kasai barely noticed as the first tear rolled down his cheek. He brushed it away as if it were an insect. Then another tear ran down his opposite cheek. Then another, and another. They came too fast for him to wipe away. He gave up and cupped his hand in his face and sobbed. I should have died at Ordu. Now I've doomed them all. He felt the presence of another approaching and assumed it was Desdemonia coming to tell him food would be ready soon. Great. Now she can see me like this. Some hero, he said, and tried his best to dry his face with the cloth of his sleeve. Even with his arm over his eyes, he could sense a great light shining and getting brighter as it approached. She must have brought a torch to light her way. He slowly dropped his arm and saw a vision of an angel appear before him. Because I thought he was dreaming. He closed his eyes fast and opened them again. But shockingly, the image remained. She was a woman, covered in golden attire, floating in the air before him. Who? Are you? Hello, ever hero. I am Illyria of the Nine, and the last daughter of the Immortal Mother. Kasai rubbed his eyes. Her aura swirled in a mist of pale gold. Rings of white and yellow danced throughout the ethereal haze to an unheard melody. It was as bright as a hundred lanterns. He immediately felt at ease. Everything about her was soothing. His body was revitalized by her presence, as if he had slept soundly and just awoke and refreshed and eager for the new day. Kasai knelt before her and placed his forehead to the cold dirt. Rise, ever hero. Your journey does not end here. There is still much to accomplish, and little time to do what must be done. Illyria spoke in a gentle, caressing voice. I have found the one I lost, but cannot go to him. The amaranthine barrier prevents me from reaching my beloved, Aetanos. Aetanos. Kasai stood and looked in the direction of Raklak Fortress, where the Chaos Gate festered. His shame was too great, and he could not make eye contact with the angel. I fear I have damned us both to everlasting torment. All is not lost, for you are the ever-hero, reborn in this age. Seca has eaten us held fast in Furia Keep. You shall rescue him and return him to me in paradise. I will then urge the immortal mother to return your souls, thereby closing the portals to the Chaos Gate. But what hope do I have against such dark power as Seca? Surely armies are needed to free him from the abyss. I'm but a simple monk. I, I am nobody. As I have said, you are the ever-hero. You shall find a way. You say that as if it will be enough, Kasai said. He was doubtful that he could do anything of the sort. I am awed by your divine presence, and humble that you have faith in me when I have none. But I'm not the one that was promised. I've tried to tell them, but they won't listen. They just want to talk of prophecy. My decisions and actions have caused nothing but misery. I'm sorry, I'm not the ever-hero. Aetonos shows wrongly. A sympathetic and compassionate smile tugged at the corners of Illyria's mouth. Trust in the wisdom of the great monk. Aetonos does not choose lightly when crafting his champions. There is great strength within you. You must only believe it belongs to you, and not dismiss it out of hand. Kasai stood in silence, contemplating her words. He could not walk away from his responsibility to protect the land and to serve its people. It was one of the cornerstones of being at one with the boundless. He needed to correct the wrongs he had committed. I assume the chaos gate will bring me to Gathos, yet I know not how to accomplish what you ask of me. No, the chaos gate is not your path, for it will lead you straight into the jaws of evil. 
Seca now assembles her frost legions to conquer the lands of mortals. I have pleaded with the immortal mother for this one favor to save the mortal realm, and she has granted passage to the one who shares the soul of Atenos. I shall help you to pass the Amarinthine barrier, as another of my celestial sisters helped him so many years ago. The Chaos Gate must be destroyed. I understand, and I will do as you ask, Kasai said, and thought for a moment about what that meant. Does that mean I will need to die? Only the immortal mother knows this answer. The weight of his request was disheartening but it was his responsibility to repair the damage he had caused. It was a fool's errand, and he would not be returning home. Yet he was honor-bound to try. I will go, though I fear I will not succeed on my own. You won't be there alone. I'm going too. Estimonia appeared from behind moss-covered boulders. A light brush of snow had fallen and dusted the winter brown hair of the hibernating flora. It collected on her hair and clothing. Illyria wore a genuine smile when she saw Desdemonia approach. You see, you have the support you need. Tess, what about returning to the forest and being at peace? Desdemonia's bewildered expression made Kasai feel as if he had said the most ridiculous thing imaginable. He wondered if he would ever understand the witch. Tess, are you sure? I don't think we will be coming back. That's why you need me there to make sure we do. Desdemonia then looked straight at Illyria. I said, I'm going too. Her amber eyes pierced forward, daring Illyria to say otherwise. Illyria nodded slightly, knowingly. Of course you are. The Kibog and Sai approached silently from different directions, surrounding the trio with swords drawn. Their uncertainty towards Illyria's identity quickly turned to astonishment when they grasped the totality of the divine being in their presence. They immediately fell to the ground in supplication. Goddess Illyria, betrothed to our lord Atenos, we are the Kibo Gansai, servants of the divine fist. Pallas spoke for the small group. Rise, friends of Atenos, there is no worry or demand that I bring to you, only the opportunity for salvation. The ever hero shall require your blades and comradeship in the trials ahead, if you will lend them. The Kibo and Sai rose together. All stood tall and ready to serve. Illyria approached them one at a time and kissed each gently upon the forehead. I bless you all with this charm against the bitter cold of Gothos, for you will know no warmth there beside what you keep in your hearts. Then she bade them place their weapons in a circle, with blades pointed inwards. She put her delicate hand upon the steel, and spoke in a language that was mystical and serene. To your weapons, I add the light of heaven, the bane of all infernal creatures, large or small. We are honored to serve, and shall forfeit our lives when necessary to fulfill heaven's request, Palo said. As one, the Kibo Gensai warriors bowed in agreement. Illyria acknowledged their oath with a thankful nod. She then turned to Kasai. Once you have freed Atenos, I shall find you again, if that is the will of the immortal mother. Wait, you cannot guarantee our way back? Kasai was alarmed at such a lack of certainty from the angel. You are the ever hero. Trust in yourself. You shall find a way if I cannot. Well, let's all hope it doesn't come to that, Kasai said, still feeling as if this was all another tragic mistake. What must we do, ever hero? Travel by way of the chaos gate? Paris said. His encouraging voice tempted Kasai out of his self-doubt. Kasai gathered his thoughts. The portal is close to us, Iris. Seca will soon bring her forces through, and we are not prepared to take on her frost legion single-handedly. Illyria knows of a different route to Gathos. Once there, we find Atenus, free him, and escape. That is our quest. Kasai looked once more at Desdemonia for reassurance. He was happy she wanted to join him, and they would be facing this challenge together. Illyria raised her hands to the sky and uttered more of her mystic language. She then pointed to the ground, and a small ring of orange and gold appeared. Holy symbols, scripted from ancient magic, sparked around the outer edge of the circle as it grew to roughly two strides in diameter. The reek of Gathos rose from its center as swirling snow and eyes vomited up from its core. The immortal mother honors her agreement. You must now honor yours. Atenos is the light that guides, Kasai said, mostly to himself. 
and jumped into the centre of the hall that led to the abyss. 2. Shivering A dark cloud rose on the horizon outside the city gates of Quakao. War banners and pennants for the markings of the four generals of the king's army broke through the groundswell of dust and debris kicked up by oncoming horses and foot soldiers. The flags flapped in the blustery air. Their swatches of color stood out against the blue-gray clouds of an early winter sky. The air was crisp and smelled of the pending arrival of new snow. The tired and battered remnants of a spliced-together army of knights, spearmen, and archers approached the gates of Quakal, entrance to the city of Spires and the throne of Barokia. An oversized banner, decorated with the image of a mighty griffin, marched proudly beside an austere carriage in the center of the procession. The ornate carriage was adorned with the colors and splendor of King Conrad. A broken man slumped at the driver's seat of the carriage. Muscular draft horses followed the beautiful carriage, drawing massive siege engines designed to pulverize stone walls and render enemy ballistas to useless broken timber. Banners with the icon of a great mastiff adorned their sides. At the head of the army was Duke Garen Shiverick, the war duke of Getham. He sat majestically on the back of a black destrier. The horse pranced forward with intimidating confidence towards the waiting city. Shivering wore no helm and enjoyed the crispness of the air as it caressed his scalp through his short cropped hair. Shivering looked ahead at the shut gates with eager anticipation. Soon they would open, and he would hear the peal of trumpets ring out a victory serenade to the returning hero of the realm. Today was to be a magnificent day. What did it matter that the king's army had suffered a terrible defeat? From this day forward, he would make things right in the kingdom. Now was his time. Shivrig was flanked by Lord Fritta and Duke Manda on horseback to his right. A dazzling young shield maiden, wearing tad breeches and a form-fitting chainmail shirt, sat upon an elegant gypsy vanner stallion to his left. A body moved sensually as it flowed with the rhythm of the gypsy vanner's movements while her onyx hair streamed in the wind, dancing in rhythm of the army's penance of a dubious honor. Fritta and Manda's mounts snort in nervous discomfort at the closeness of the shield maiden. Chivalry understood their unease, but allies were scarce and exceptions had been made. This is a day long overdue, Chivalry said. He looked along the rising merlons and spacious crenelles of the battlement walls surrounding the city. He saw the image of a griffin pouncing to and fro as the late king's flags billowed in the wind. The false icon of House Conrad would not see another sunrise. A lone rider emerged on a young chestnut roan from a door to the right of the massive city gates. The horse and rider cantered to the vanguard to greet the four leading the king's army home. What news, Duke Shiverick? Has our great King Conrad brought victory to the kingdom of Barokia? The emissary said as he stopped five horse lengths from the procession. Shivrig heard the insult to his station in the emissary's words. He would remember this one's face. It was a quick and well-executed campaign, Shivrig said with confidence. His large hands, encased in oversized gauntlets, rested on the horn of his dark leather saddle. The tower watch gave the word that your host is now but a third of what left Kokal. It is a dark victory when so many men will not return to loved ones. General Rokik did not understand the nature of his foe, and his opening foray was ill-timed. It was a decision that cost much of our strength. And where is High General Rokik? Does he farewell, I hope? I do not see him present. The emissary looked quizzically about the foursome, looking askance at the shield maiden. Rokik fell in battle against the enemy's warlord. He was valiant to the end. Conrad then rightfully elevated me to high general of the field, and we routed the enemy. It was a decisive victory, but the war is far from won. We will need to reassess our strength and muster fresh troops. Now open the gates. These men are weary from battle and the long march home. His emissary narrowed his eyes and looked suspiciously at the shield maiden. She leered back at him with a devilish grin. The emissary diverted his eyes past Shivering to the king's carriage, and our 
beloved King Conrad. I wonder why he is not here at the forefront of such a great victory. The concern was rising in the truth of his words. King Conrad saw fit to allow me this last honor and lead the troops home through the gates of Quokal. Now, I will say again, open the gates. The emissary was hesitant. He looked to Fritta and Manda for some validation in Shiverick's claim. Fritta's expression remained stoic, while Manda wore a face of indifference. The emissary finally capitulated. Yes, my lord Shiverick, as you command. The emissary raised his hand and signaled the gates to open. He turned his horse and cantered to the small entrance from where he initially emerged. Exactly as I command. Shiverick sat with a satisfied and bemused smile. His destry apart at the ground. The animal could sense his eagerness to move on. Soon, a shivering would ride through the gates of Quakal as a conquering hero. The capital city would welcome him as their lost son, thankful for his return to prominence and their continued safety. He would purge the land of its treasonous politicians that fleeced the kingdom of the twisted agendas. Shiverig would restore order to the realm. Once his troops occupied the city, his coup would be complete, and how Shiverig would regain the throne of Barokia. Ah, what a sweet day it shall be. A small flutter of snow fell gently over the open road. The fulfillment of his destiny opened before him with the movement of the gates. Shiverick heard the frantic gallop of a rider speeding from the far left and towards the emissary. His broken and spoiled armor cast no shine in the dull morning light. A wasted cloth bearing the emblem of a pouncing griffin whipped behind the horse's lathered flanks. The riders met halfway to the gate. The exhausted knight gestured wearily and pointed at Shiverig and his host. The emissary looked back in shock. His hand flew to the air, signaling the gates of Quokal to close. It seems the knights loyal to the dead king were not all slain as instructed, the shield maiden said. Her words were as light as his child's playful giggle. I don't think they will believe King Conrad fell by the hands of the enemy. Or not at least, not the enemy you intended. <laughs> Shirik scoffed at her wry observation. Her eerie childlike laughter unnerved him, and his mood soured. This is unfortunate. I had hoped to gain a quick entrance before the auxiliary guard could mount a proper resistance. The siege shall be costly in time and morale. Leave that to me, she said, wearing a wolfish grin. She unclasped the chainmail shirt and let it drop to the cold dirt. Her white skin took on a bluish hue in the early light as she rose into the sky on freshly sprouted, thin membrane wings. No, Sistra! But it was too late. The demon had already revealed herself. The guards upon the battlements remained stupefied as the sultry winged horror flew towards them. Kill it! The captain of the guard yelled out to his men, driving them into action. Arrows flew at Sestra, but she was too agile for their clumsy attempts. Soon she was over the walls and descended out of sight. The knight and the emissary drew swords and charged Shiverick. Murderer! the knight yelled. Shiverick sighed. The hard way, then. He unsheathed his bastard sword and trotted out to meet his new foes. The knight arrived first and lashed out quickly and deliberately at Shiverick, who turned the tired knight's thrust with ease. But instead of striking back, Shivering chopped down on the unprotected neck of the knight's horse. Blood sprayed up in a grisly red fountain, coating the surprised knight. He instinctually brought his arm up to block the excessive gore from blinding him. Shivering pulled his sword arm back as the dying horse faltered and collapsed. The emissary attacked, and Shivering twisted his sword sideways to block his thrust. Shivering countered with a powerful sweeping blow, nearly knocking the emissary out of his saddle. He then directed a sword thrust between the emissary's breastplate and light pauldron, finding the unprotected flesh and vitals. The emissary slumped forward in his saddle when Shivery pulled his blade free. Shivery looked for the hampered knight and found him scurrying away from his dead horse. Shivery sent his horse forward into a leaping gallop. His bloodied sword crashed into the neck and shoulder of the knight, severing the steel plate and lodging itself into the man's body. The knight's knees buckled and Shivery ripped his sword free. He looked to the top of the wall. The archers now had a more natural target, knocked arrows and drew bowstrings to their chin. Duke Shiverig, you shall pay for your crimes against the crown, the captain of the guard atop the wall shouted out. Shiverig turned to his loyal men. 
They were ready with trained arrows on the archers upon the wall. Unleash, Shivered commanded. Black shafts shot into the air and found their marks. But those that had escaped the first volley were forced to remain behind the safety of the Merlins as arrows continuously sailed upwards. Shivering turned his eyes to the gates. They were once again moving in his favor, Sestra sauntering through the slender but widening gap. He drew his horse closer while she licked the blood off her delicate fingers. When will you learn to do as you are told? Shivering said. She frustrated him to no end with her disobedience. Probably never she said with a wicked smile as she shrugged her shoulders. Shivrick shook his head. You push too far, Succubus. Oh, stop pouting. Your kingdom awaits. We shall have words when this is over, Shivrick said. Then he called to his men. To the gates. Take the city. Sestra's wings unfurled and she took to the air as the army raced towards the gates of Quakal, eager to do his bidding. Manda trotted up to Shivrick and nodded in the direction of the demon as she flew over the wall. You have much to explain, Shivrick. You hide the enemy we fight against in plain sight. It is a temporary but necessary alliance. One must fully understand an adversary if he is to prevail at the highest level. We know little of demon kind. That childish creature will provide me with all we need to know of how to defeat the hordes of Maugris. I do not intend to suffer another loss, such as that that brought down Conrad. In time, we will rebuild Barokia's armies to stand against and defeat this new foe. This is madness. Are you foolish enough to think any of the demon kind can be trusted? Shivrig smiled sarcastically at his newly acquired co-conspirator. Of course they cannot be trusted, but there is a longer game to play here. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Manda watched with calculating eyes as the color of his troops meshed with those of House Shivery and House Fritta. Their combined forces rushed past the gates and through the short tunnel en route to secure the capital city. You were wise to add your surviving troops to my cause after Conrad fell in battle. He fought valiantly to the end, Shivery said. The manner of King Conrad's death is irrelevant to me. Frankly, he was a fool to assume command of this campaign, and fools are bad for profit. Yes, and profit is profit. Exactly. Although I did not account for such dark alliances with fell creatures as part of my support. You look concerned, Manda, Shivery suggested. Should I not be worried about the company you keep? What other wicked secrets will you unveil in the coming rule? It was important to keep the identity of the succubus secret until we have established the new rule. Fritta brought his horse to stand close to Shivrick's Amanda's mouth, his expression downcast. Shall history remember us as saviors of the kingdom, or fell creatures as dark as the enemy we opposed? Come, Lord Manda, Lord Fritta, such dire words. This day is ours. Let us claim our prize and raise Barokia to greatness never seen before in the Three Kingdoms. Barokia shall need a minister of finance to appropriately tax the greater and lesser houses to fund the coming war. They have skirted their responsibility to the realm for far too long. The army will also need a competent war marshal to muster our troops against our mutual foe. I can think of no others than the two of you for such positions. Let us rejoice. A new era of prosperity and empire is upon us. Yes, Shivrick said, this is a magnificent day. He urged his horse forward through the gates of Quakal. The city of spires was aptly named for its tall, spire-shaped columns that rose into the air like thin fingers, tickling the underside of the seven heavens. Uniquely colored stones were used to create dazzling mosaic designs that raced and churned from one tower to the next, like fierce rapids flowing through the decadent city. Height was considered an aspect of prestige, and the rich spared no cost at outbuilding their political or financial rivals. High buttresses secured the tall spires and prevented the towers from toppling. The numerous forms jutted from the curved sides, and sky-high walkways connected adjacent towers, locking them in place. Shivering playfully mused over the idea of occupying the late king's magnificent estate, or racing it. Quakal doesn't have quite the same flavor as your beloved Gethem, does it? It's so clean, the people so 
docile, mused Sestra as she trotted up to Shivrick upon her gypsy van. The killing of the resistance had stopped, and the city was now in a state of quiet shock. This city wears a false skin. The corrupt politicians only polish the surface to get what they wanted, but never bothered to remove the filth from its pores. And why should they? They are from the filth and give birth to more, as they climb their ladders of small influence, striving for power that was acquired by sleight of hand rather than earned in battle. They are the reason the filth exists. Remove its thin veneer, and this is a stagnant, dying place, while the character of Gethem remains true, replied Shivery. And what character is that, O oh, great duke? The people of Gethem are loyal to House Shivrig, he said. Shivrig looked squarely at Sestra, unquestionably loyal. You will need that level of devotion in the days to come, Sestra said. <laughs> the kingdom has grown weak, and these paper lords will easily crumble. None shall usurp the rule of House Shivrig again. Shivrig urged his destria forward towards the capital building. He had much to do. Shivrig opened a side door to the grand throne room of Quakal. The clamorous uproar of frustrated and indignant nobles and their families rushed to envelop him. The families loyal to House Conrad had been gathered together and packed into one area to receive their new king. A line of armed knights bearing the Shivrig colors of deep purple and rose pressed back the agitated crowd. Shivrig was appalled at the changes House Conrad had made to the throne room. Banners depicting the dead king's victory over Maugris and his northern horde had already been hung. Presumptuous fool. Never again will lesser men rule the lands tamed and harnessed by the blood of his ancestors, thought Shivering. He walked purposefully to the throne. Dax had arrived earlier in the day and now stood at ease next to Malachi. The arch Vashim, however, looked worn and thin. Shivering would need to remind his adviser to keep himself clean. Too much interaction with the demon kind led to the corruption of the mind, in Malachi's case, also the body. Shivrig scanned the faces of the assembled nobles. He hated them all. It was time to leave the broken path that the misguided realm had trod along for more than a generation, and to do so, the noble class would need to change. Shivrig, what is the meaning of this? Where is King Conrad? One noble shouted above the clamoring crowd. Dead. The king is dead. Another noble made herself heard. Shivering is in league with demons, a third noble said. Shivering did not care to note who said which remark. All in the room were complicit in keeping him from his birthright. Shivering raised his arm to quiet the room. I was going to tell you of the heroic way Conrad fell in battle, protecting the realm from evil. But alas, that story will never make it into the sagas of lore. The truth is, when his poorly appointed High General Roki allowed the enemy to swarm our unstructured and unsupported men, the army was overrun. Conrad ran with his tail between his legs, racing back to the protection of the high walls of Quakal. Unfortunately, he was flanked by enemy barbarians from the north. I arrived too late and could not save your king. Lies! You have befriended the enemy and brought it to our homes! Shivering quieted the room once more. I'm sure you all have something of inconsequential value to add, but it is time we came to terms, he said. Duke Shivering, we are not sheep you can herd into submission. Your lust for power is well known and will not stand, Lord Jolla said as he stepped to the front of the crowd. He was precisely the type of man Shivering loathed. Jolla was an opportunist and a schemer. He and his family had ridden the coattails of House Conrad for two generations. House Jolla was new to money and did not understand the importance of tradition. Where is the true heir to the throne? Where is Prince Dane? Prince Dane has seen the folly in his father's ways and has abdicated the throne to me. He understands a stronger Barokia will be needed to defeat the enemy, Shivering said. And that means how Shivering will conveniently assume the throne? Why should House Shivering enjoy such ease into the seat of ultimate power? Where is the vote? What of House Jala? 
I say our time has come. Other lords shouted praises for Lord Jala or voiced their claim to the vacant throne. Lord Jala, you amuse me with such airs. What right to the throne of Barokia could you or any of the lords present here possibly imagine you have? Were you on the field of battle when the blood of Barokia was spilled defending the land, and when the demon horde broke through Rokig's ranks and slaughtered the men of the king's army? Did you rally the men under one banner and return to the city of Spires to protect the people and ease their fearful hearts? No, you did none of these things, for you were not there. You hid in your mansions or country estates. You let others bear the weight of hard decisions and bloodshed. Which brings me to the reason you are all here. I offer you this choice. Freely acknowledge me as the rightful ruler of Barokia, or consider yourself an enemy to the throne. The rightful ruler? Lord Jola looked astounded by Shivrig's proclamation. Never! How Shivrig's time has passed! I will not submit to your wild ideas and nefarious liaisons. Bring me Prince Dane. I wish to hear from his mouth that he is not the true king. The noble's fists flew in the air, and many shouted for the appearance of Prince Dane. Shivrig nodded to himself, knowingly. He didn't think this meeting would go any differently than it did, and he was glad that it didn't. Lord Jala, your voice is undoubtedly loudest in a room full of dissenters. I can appreciate the loyalty to the prince you have exhibited, and for once you show a redeeming character trait. Nonetheless, you, your families, and the fellow lords present are charged with treason to the realm. You have plundered the kingdom and shirked your responsibility to defend its people and lands from hostile intent. I will determine your fate in time. Take them away. The side chamber doors opened, and a company of armed knights, clothed in purple and rose, surrounded the crowd, and escorted the condemned nobles out of the room. What will you do with them? Malachi inquired. He scratched the butt of the wrapped stump where his right hand had once been. They shall be dealt with according to their crimes, unless I can think of a better use for them, Shiri said. Barokia shall be ruled by empirical martial law, as my forefathers had intended. The populace will either abide by the shivery law and enjoy the prosperity to come, or resist and sway in the gallows. Your edict will flow easily through the streets and taverns of Gethem, but the people of Quakal have enjoyed a different life for too many years. You cannot expect them to change so readily, Malachi said. Duke Shivery pondered Malachi's words. There was always unrest in every regime change. He would deal with the most vocal dissenters publicly, and in time the people would be swayed. Malachi continued. Rumors spread that you killed the king in cold blood. Already the lesser houses outside of Quakal are rallying together to bring you to justice. You will need to hold the city of Spires by force, loose the city and loose the throne. Then... I appoint you, my minister of the word. Use your silver tongue to convince them otherwise. Feed the peasants bread and meat each week, and send messages to the lords of the lesser houses. Tell them I have lowered their taxes for the remainder of the year. They will soon forget their loyalty to King Conrad, and no longer care to know the manner of his demise. And tear those bloody griffins down. Shiver glanced at Dax. And what of Seca? Did she succeed in her efforts to capture her ever-hero? The mistress has arrived with her frost legions, and soon will claim the frontier villages as was agreed upon, Dax said with indifference, as if this was well-known and accepted information. That is more than what was promised, Shiverick said, outwardly disgruntled. Already the agreements were changing. He had expected as much and was inwardly pleased. His new rule depended on directing the subjects of the kingdom towards a common enemy, one that only he could defeat. It would soon turn Maugr's blunder of summoning the devil Seca and her foul minions to his most significant advantage. Shivrig mused over the foundational pieces being set to build his new empire upon. It was his destiny to outshine his forefathers and be a more celebrated conqueror than the legendary overlord Barak Shivrig. 
Remind Seca that the agreed-upon tithe was a remote village or two each season, and to stay away from the main cities of Barokia. She honors the pact. The kingdom of Sun shall bear the weight of her needs. If there is nothing more, I have pressing business for the mistress elsewhere. Shivrig dismissed him with an off-handed wave. Soon, the one land that had somehow remained outside of the dominion of my family's rule thought Shivrik. Once the throne was secured, he intended to extend the borders of his kingdom. The land of Soon looked very appetizing to him. 3. Seka Seka's slick body rose from the Chaos Gate's slushy surface and into the frigid air of Gathos. The light snowfall was a welcome homecoming. The nether portal hissed as bubbles burst under her feet, but its surface remained stable enough for her to walk across. A viscous film covered her naked skin, which mirrored the shifting colors rising from the demonic gateway. The transition felt like crossing through a thick membrane of gooey oil, not altogether unpleasant to Seca's human form, but messy. She looked about her icy realm and was pleased. Her power base would soon grow ten thousandfold, and her ascendancy to the loftiest station in the pantheon of the abyss was all but guaranteed. Sika scanned the frozen ground until she saw the broken body of Maugris. Remarkably, the mortal still lived. Somehow he had crawled across the surface of the portal and dragged his mangled body under the cold terrain. He, too, was covered in the sloppy remains of traveling through the Chaos Gate. What remained of his scorched robe was curled into thick black clumps of melted fabric. Seca scoffed in disdain as Margaret tried to rise on shaking legs. The fool was trying to escape. The break in his shoulder looked painful, and his right arm hung uselessly by his side. His other arm held his chest tight in a failed attempt to prevent his broken ribs from moving on their own. I don't understand. Mine to command, and mine. Margaret's mad eyes searched for the answer in the snow. The chaos gate hissed again, and Seca approached the injured sorcerer. He looked at her in horror as she transformed into her demonic form. She lurched forward and grabbed him in her massive talons. Margaret grimaced in pain as she shook him like a rag doll. Welcome to Gathos, Maugris the Infinite. Seca pounded her thoughts into his mind. She was going to enjoy his suffering. She would possibly find a use for him in the future, for he was a competent mage, but foolish in his overreaching ambition. That had been his downfall. She would let Chidipe, her trusted demon witch and chief tormentor, toy with him for a century or two. Maybe even give him a taste of freedom between her sessions. Just enough to give him hope he could escape his fate. Then she would yank it away. For having hope in the abyss was the worst torment of them all. Seca raised Margaret's body close to her face and shook him violently. Wake up! Margaret's eyes half opened. Just kill me, he said meekly. Her laughter rose about the howling wind. She tossed him to the base of an X-shaped crucifix with a man who was bound to its beams. His head was low to his chest and his arms and legs were outstretched and nailed to the ends. He looked exhausted and defeated. Say hello to Aetnas. No, no, no! Malgris groaned and broke Aetnas from his stupor. Seca transformed back to her human form and kicked Malgris like a mangy cur. Yes, and he has been here all along, even when you cast your pitiful spell to save the three kingdoms. Malgris looked up at Aetinus in disbelief. Is it true? My spell? I was to be chosen? Aetinus sadly nodded. The chill wind blew through Seca's alabaster hair and spun it like a whirling dervish. She loved the sensation of cold air upon a human skin. She drank in the sorry state of Aetnos. Somehow, she felt a deeper connection to his despair through immortal eyes. Aetnos' head swayed in the wind, 
Eventually he recognized her, and she saw his misery rekindled in his heart. He had been the catalyst for her cunning plan to birth the Chaos Gate. I have returned victorious, great monk. Nothing can stop me now. Seca gloated and caressed Aetanos' bruised cheek with a tender hand, as a mother would comfort a child. Ever, hero, Aetanos forced out the words through frostbitten lips. He was nothing. The boy was scared and weak. You should have chosen better. He shall find a way. Seca broke into a burst of incredulous laughter. <laughs> His soul is mine, as is yours, forever trapped in the dimensional core of the Chaos Gate. Aetanos looked into Seca's eyes with a glazed stare. You will not win. Seca laughed at the absurdity of the remark. She had already won. Soon her legions would march on the undefended mortal realm, where she would reap countless souls. Her warlords had assembled the Frost Legion at Furia Keep. She must be quick to harvest her bounty and transform the pure soul energy of the humans into mighty weapons. Finally, she would destroy her last rival, the Devil Zisfander. Goodbye, old friend. I must awake Lord Osiax from his astral sleep. Her body pressed close to the monk as she kissed him passionately. Her tongue found his. She mercilessly played with it, sucking on it and blunging it like a pit fighter's punches. She bit hard on his lip as she withdrew. I still wonder at the fortuitous gift you handed me by coming here. How could one such as you be so misguided? Illyria has abandoned you, Seca said as she licked Aetanos' fresh blood from her lips. Illyria, save Illyria. Seca relinquished her embrace and backed away, shaking her head. The man was mad. It mattered not, crazed or insane, the divine soul of Athenos was hers for eternity. Greater forces at play, Athenos whispered from split lips, dripping blood. His head sank back to his chest. Seca's brow furrowed. I am the greater force. But the monk was unconscious again. She snatched up a thick tuft of Malgris hair and dragged him in her wake. She walked with sure and swift footsteps on the icy terrain. The laughter mingled and echoed with a howling wind. Seca entered a large chamber filled with iced columns, connecting the cold floor to a ceiling that remained out of sight. The room smelled of dead things forced to live once more. Damaged and fetid flesh was reworked into living tissue, tendons, and bones. Hundreds of wells of various diameters spotted the floor. Slow condensation dripped into the open pits, adding to the dark, murky substance or splattered apart on the frozen floor. Stalactites and stalagmites welded together over the eons, formed bizarre floor-to-ceiling columns of ice. The dim, cold light coming from the center of the activated wells was all that lit the room. The pits were rejuvenation graves. The chamber served to house the mending of the physical forms of Seca's more powerful minions, provided their dark essence was not thoroughly compromised, as was the fate of Lord Alstheus at the hands of the Red Devil Sisfander. Most of the pits were filled with a stagnant sludge waiting to be activated. Wicked creatures slithered and swirled under the frosted surface, creating hypnotic currents as they prepared each vat for its next occupant. The pit that held Lord Ossiax's essence was overflowing with a frozen slush of putrefied flesh, human blood, and dark magic. The demon lord's head slowly knit itself back together, along with the rest of his abyssal form. The process was slow and painful as evident from the muffled howls coming from the open pit. Seca pondered on the events that had destroyed her mighty warlord and begrudgingly appreciated the strength of the ever-hero. The boy had summoned an immense power to kill Osiax, so said Kalkaroth after the warlord fell in battle. Somehow, while under the stresses of torture in an adult mind, Athanas had passed his divine strength to the boy. 
The boy had momentarily become a potent force. It was quite an amazing feat, considering the presence of the amaranthine barrier. Too bad it was so short-lived, she said. She knew the outcome of that battle would be quite different on Garthos. Arceax could draw strength from the souls suffering under her dominion, as he had done countless times in the past. He was a true champion of the abyss. But perhaps she had been too hasty to let the boy remain free in the mortal realm. With his soul attached to the Chaos Gate, she could have brought him here. Ha! <laughs> he is nothing more than a trivial lose end. There will be plenty of time for merriment later. But wouldn't it be interesting if I could harness the divine power of Athenos and his ever-hero into a weapon to use against my enemies? Now that would be something. She let the thought ruminate in the back of her mind. Seca turned to the pit containing Lord Nartroth's demonic essence. It held some of the demon's personal artifacts, hair and a random tooth Shadippy had found in his lair. It wasn't much material, and recovering his physical form would take more time to manifest, since Maugris' obliteration spell had destroyed most of his essence in Raklak Fortress. There was a high probability he would never return. But a mortal's magic is nothing compared to one born in the abyss, she said. It was a gamble for her to sacrifice Nartoth so soon. He was a powerful asset to her Frost Legion, and his absence in the coming campaign through the Three Kingdoms of Hannah would be problematic. But she had done what was needed to drain enough magical energy for Malgris and finally dissolve the spell of binding he had placed on her. She hoped luck would stay on her side long enough for Nartoth to be fully restored. Unfortunately, due to the nature of his demise in Margris Fortress, the warlord would not be permitted to enter the mortal realm for a thousand years. She scowled. It might take that amount of time or more just to get him back. Seca returned to the pit where Osiax reformed. Not long now, she thought, as the slush in his hole heaved and thrashed. It was clear he was becoming more conscious, as one massive arm shot into the air, and the thick tentacles that formed his hand snaked around a frozen column. The demon lord roared in triumph as he pulled himself from the rejuvenation grave. Osiak's wet white mane hung heavy across his broad shoulders and muscular back. His chest heaved as it took in large gulps of air to fill empty lungs. He stared menacingly at Seca until he recognized her and his surroundings. He lowered himself to one knee at her feet. My queen, I have failed you. The power of Atenos passed to another, and I was taken unaware. Osiak's tentacles absently caressed his skull. Seca scrutinized him. What did you think would happen when you finally encountered the Ever Hero? Nonetheless, the Chaos Gate lives. Soon my Frost Legion shall march on the mortal realm and harvest souls with impunity. Yes, growled Osiax. He raised himself from the ground and stretched to his full height. I shall enjoy such a feast. You know the rules. You are forbidden to set foot in the mortal realm for a millennium. Such is the punishment for death at the land of humans. Lord Arsiax roared in frustration. Damn the soul of the boy monk! Had I known the bond he shared, I would have... You would have done nothing different. You played the part needed to move the young monk one step closer to the trap. You shall remain on Gathos and defend Furia Keep until I have harvested enough soul energy to defeat Sysvander. For now, regain your strength. Furia Keep must not fall. It shall be as you bid, my queen. Seca noticed Osek's contemplative eyes, thoughtfully planning. You shall do nothing until I have given my command. Is that understood, Lord Osiax? Seca noted the scowl on Osiax's face. The laws established for the abyss, the mortal realm, and the seven heavens were set and could not be undone, save for the will of the creator goddess. Only the immortal mother could breach these steadfast rules. The great balance must remain. A thousand years wasn't so long. Seca had suffered the same fate at the hands of eight now so many years before. She would merely acquire another capable warlord to lead her legions throughout the three kingdoms. 
one that was of mortal blood and more easily controlled. Garen Shiverick would do nicely, once he partook of the demon seed, of course. It was still one of the best ways to get a demon into the mortal realm. Seca had provided Sestra with the essence of the demoness Jinx, and left the details of administration in the capable hands of her succubus. Once Shiverick had bonded with the spiritual substance of Jinx, he would be under Seca's control. If he refused, he would die. But for now she had more immediate needs, and had summoned temporary replacements from the Baron Tundra Vizen. Not her first choice, but they were who was available, and she was desperate for more souls now. Seca thought again of converting the Everhero into her champion. Oh, what delight that would be, and such misery for the great monk to suffer. The depths of her wickedness thrilled her as she called five thralls to attend the Lord Ossiax. They examined his body and wrapped him in wet, pungent sheets. Seca strode from the chamber. Her frost legion awaited her command. She had commanded a portion of a frost legion to assemble on the frozen plains of Thresh, which surrounded the Chaos Gate. They waited impatiently for her to send them through the gaping portal and into a world ripe for pillage and slaughter. Seca was due to meet with her newly appointed warlords. She had partitioned off four legions, each ten thousand strong, whose primary role was to gather humans for the soul harvest. Seca was already spread thin, with many of her legendary behemoths quelling the uprisings of lesser devils on other kingdoms across the levels of the abyss. This move would decrease the number of remaining troops of Gathos to dangerously low levels. She realized she left herself only enough to defend the siege of Furia Keep. Each day she waited to begin the soul harvest was another day her arch-nemesis drew closer. Without the additional human slaves and the soul energy they provided to fuel her war machine, she would not win a battle of attrition against Sisfander. Sisfander had grown too bold, even for him. He must have made a pact with a shadow patron, she thought. It was the only explanation for his ability to move his armies secretly and unrestricted through the abyssal plains. The red devil and his fiery horde had reached Gathos undetected, while Sek had been under the binding spell of Maukris. She fumed at the thought of being held against her will by the sorcerer, regardless that it was a crucial part of a devious plan to create the Chaos Gate. Still, he would suffer much for his role. Sek pondered the idea of Sisfander accepting the gifts of a shadow patron. She understood the strategy and had been tempted to do the same in the past. The alliance created a substantial, albeit temporary, power base for the beneficiary. There was always a considerable cost with such partnerships, which often left the recipient depleted and paying off a soul debt for millennia. And Seca refused to be the indebted thrall of another, unless there was no other solution. Thankfully, her cunning mind had always found a workable alternative as she rose through the lower and the higher echelons of the abyss. Seca wondered how far this fander would go to unseat her from a beloved Gothos. Would it be worth a devil's lifetime of servitude? He had nipped at her haunches like an old hound for centuries. Yes, she had grown strong and influential quickly and acquired many jealous rivals along the way. But his determination was perverse. The thought of a union between this fander and a shadow patron unnerved her. There was more behind his relentless pursuit than mere jealousy. Something or someone pushed him to keep her in check and always stall her plans. But who could it be and why? A terrible realization crossed her mind that she loathed accepting, but her dark instinct knew it to be true. Sisfander's shadow patron was one of the great three. Who else would have enough infernal power and influence to contest her might? Only with the help of Asrolorsa, Sertotha, or Bodiliax could Sesfander overthrow her now. The reality of that possibility filled her with foreboding. Seca looked upon her eager warriors. The swollen ranks of fiends and demons contained a mass of horrors filled with oddly shaped creatures covered in horns, coarse hair, and slithering parts. 
The minions jostled against each other in a mounting excitement to kill. And within the center of each company stood a ponderous juggernaut, an immensely powerful demon that could wade through enemy troops, causing excessive mayhem with their enormous strength. But the juggernauts lacked in intelligence they made up for in sheer destructive power. The juggernauts grew smaller than the behemoths of Gothos, their larger brethren, which stood as tall as a castle wall. However, these demons were still the size of tall siege towers and stood on four massive legs. Relinquishing such force to the mortal realm was a necessary risk with Sesfander's forces already upon the outer reaches of Gothos. She needed to hold the conquered territories of the three kingdoms once she began her invasion. She reckoned she would have the first harvest of human souls to replenish her ranks on Gathos before committing to a full engagement with Sisfander. Seca approached the four warlords of Vissen, two brothers and two sisters, who fought as strongly against their enemies as they did amongst themselves. An unsavory choice to lead her assault into the three kingdoms of Hannah, for they were untested in the mortal realm and unpredictable. The warlords of Vissen removed their black helmets as she acknowledged each in turn. Sistrix, a monstrous warrior, held a long black lance at his side and raised it to salute his queen. Ice blue runes blazed along its dark shaft. His human body resembled the thick bulk of his demonic form. His head was crowned by six sharp horns that crested a mane of black hair. Sistrix's eyes remained locked on Sekka. She momentarily wondered if he was assessing her strength, searching for a weakness he could one day exploit. Every creature in the abyss wanted more. He eventually broke his gaze and stared into the chaos gate. You will honor your promise, Citrix said in a statement of fact rather than a question. Provided you deliver what I require without delay or interruption, then yes, you will have your command of the Frost Legion. Seka eyed the tall warlord directly and added, Shall you fail? Your essence will never return to be reformed, not to the mortal realm or the abyss. Am I clear? Citrix gave an abrupt nod. Good, she said. And Arceax, a female voice said. Seka turned to see Tazizu, the warrior witch, her pupil-less eyes were nestled in black slits that sloped upwards on her face. Her hairless head sat high on a lanky, lean frame, and was tattooed with blood-red symbols of arcane might. And when we fulfill our obligation to you, Lord Arceax will be ours to do with as we like. Her voice rose above the din of the massed troops in a high-pitched shrill. Tassisu's leather armor was a colored patchwork of reddish and blue-gray hides. It was form-fitting and made from the tough skins of her demonic rivals, which she had covered in ancient runes of mystical power. Seka appreciated the symbolic touch. An orange sigil spun slowly above her head, made up of delicately shaped runes, with tendrils of dark energy that snaked and snapped in the air. Tazizu held a three-lashed whip, ending in cruel ice barbs that spewed ice shards as it swayed in the winds of Gothos. As per our agreement, if you succeed, then Lord Ossiax shall be yours. Seka heard a peal of bold laughter to the right of Tazizu. Her sister, Ashmara, sat proudly on her steed and could not control her high spirits. At last, the warlords of Vison shall be avenged. She drew two double-bladed daggers that she deftly manipulated through her long fingers and raised them in a salute to Seka. A different malefic rune pulsed on each of the dark edges. She looked through dark slate-blue eyes, which were the color of a coming storm. Her head was wreathed by a waterfall of straight white hair. Black runes faded in and out of existence as they swirled in the cloud of hazy darkness that surrounded her. Aishmara was shorter than her sister and the youngest of the brood. She wore subtle, form-fitting armor that flexed with her movements. She was smooth and quick. Seka could see the height of ambition in her stormy eyes. Seka lastly acknowledged Daiko Zeor, the frail and sinister warlock. He sat hunched and hooded in his saddle and remained aloof to the excitement of coming war. 
It was rumored he drew his arcane power from blood pacts made with ancient entities long forgotten by time, who remained in a sleepless state of consciousness, watching and waiting for the moment to be reborn. Seca was most cautious of Daiko Zero. She searched for his demonic essence and found nothing. Perhaps it was engaged elsewhere, communing on a distant plane of existence, not connected to any of the known layers of the abyss. One foe at a time, she thought. I shall deal with this abomination once the flow of souls has begun. Each warlord sat upon a bestial mount that gnashed their teeth at any nearby warrior who happened to stray too close. The mounts were an amalgam of creatures from the mortal realm, but were beings of pure chaos. Their upper bodies resembled sleek hunting beasts, covered in smooth ash-colored scales. And from the lower extremities extended six insectoid appendages that ended in razor-sharp tips. Each point scratched deep furrows into the frozen ground as they shifted and flexed. Their muscular necks were thick and stout, allowing their rider to fight efficiently on either side. The beasts sniffed the air at Seca's approach and snapped their mean muzzles into the air in anticipation of the hunt. Seca was full of pride at her impressive force. The three kingdoms of Hannah would be the first of many lands in the mortal realm to fall to her. Nothing could stop her now. Seca gazed to the center of the Chaos Gate, where her thralls had moved Aetanos, still nailed to his crucifix. A hover spell had been cast upon the posts as it bobbed and spun slowly above the living portal. He would be forced to watch her troops enter the mortal realm to wreak their havoc, all because he was too foolish to come to Gathos. Somehow, it should not have been so easy. A worrisome suspicion entered her mind that her good fortune had happened at the will of another and that things were not as they seemed. <laughs> I know what I'm doing, she said, and sent the first of her troops through the chaos gate. Four. Desdemonia. Don't you let me go, Desdemonia yelled back as her foot sought purchase on a small outcrop of the cliff wall. Cassiath slowly belayed the rope tied around her waist to where Paolo stood ready to grab her and pull her to the safety of the ledge. Can't say this is my favorite thing to do, she shouted, as Paolo reached for the front of her Molochuk coat. Run Run had wisely equipped each of the party members with special gear for the cold. There were plenty of supplies left behind by the retreating soldiers of the king's army. The heavy furs were durable and flexible, and a handy addition on their journey. Kasai climbed down when she was secured on the ledge. Even on the icy rocks, he moved like a spider, with not one slip or misstep. Estimonia figured his training at Ordo had prepared him for the challenging climbs, seeing how the entire monastery was practically built on the side of a cliff. But this? She looked around. How could anyone be prepared for this? She was amazed that the small party had made it this far without losing anyone. A fall from this height would mean certain death. Where to from here, Captain? She shouted above the wind as he joined them. Kasai gave her a half-smile and shot a worried look to the sky. She followed his eyes and saw the storm was getting worse. Down. You'd think Illyria could have placed us closer to Aetanos, or at least on flat ground, right? Testimonia said as she hugged her arms around her body. The blessing of warmth Illyria had given each of them was working, but it didn't completely shut out the cold. I mean, really? The sight of a volcano? Shut your mouth, witch, Oren said. His eyes glared daggers at her. I grow tired of your blaspheming tongue. Des just rolled her eyes. Oren took everything so seriously. We are here because this was the way he took. Somehow that's important, Kasai said. The wind picked up again and it was getting difficult to hear. Why? How do you know? Des quickly asked. I don't know. I can't explain why, but it all feels so familiar. Dark clouds spat out sheets of rain which froze upon the dead volcano's rocky surface, coating it with a glaze of ice. Paolo looked down the cliff wall. He was filled with trepidation about continuing without rest. Estimonia didn't blame him. I know you're tired, but we need to keep moving. We won't survive trapped on this cliff when the new storm hits, Cassius said and 
pointed to an oncoming mass of black and purple thunderclouds. We will follow your lead, Palos spoke for the group. Each gave a brief nod of agreement. Only Eris was hesitant. The youngster's face was downcast and his eyes were hidden in the hood of his cloak. He moved slowly past Kasai to gather some rope, and Desdemonia saw he favored his right side. They had all pushed their bodies to their limit, herself included. But something about being in this place made her magic stir. Something new was growing inside her. She looked to see how Kasai was holding up. His body carried the weight of fatigue, as did the others. But his eyes looked hollow, almost haunted. We keep going, she said, and nodded her encouragement to him. Paolo moved carefully to Kasai's right side. He cupped his hand over Kasai's ear and pointed to the left. Run Run has spotted a route to get to that large outcropping. It should give us some shelter from this rain. Kasai nodded in favor of the route. The wind picked up and brought with it blinding sleet that blurred Desdemonia's vision. She squinted at the proposed route as lightning flashed in the sky above. The icy second skin of the mountain gleamed back. Bolts of electric air crackled and sizzled in the air as more swollen thunderheads swirled around the desolate summit. And I could have been halfway home to my little cottage by now, she said, knowing no one could hear her. We must move, Kasai shouted above the din. We don't have much time. The party pressed on. Run Run's routes proved reliable and safe, and the companions made their way down the side of the volcano. It was an arduous process, and the weather grew worse as time wore on. Run Run was an excellent guy and spotted routes that were unseen by the others. At last, they had reached the base of the sheer wall. Valeria watches over us with her protective hand, Eris said, and he dropped to his knees with exhaustion. Kasai noticed a trail of blood following Eris in the snow. Praise is to aid in us in his guiding light, Orin said, who also collapsed in the snow near Iris. He saw the blood as well. You're hurt. I caught a shard of the mountain in my leg. It's nothing, Eris said. He clamped down with his hand on the outside of his leg. He hadn't said a word through the entire descent, but his face showed the pain that he hid behind pressed lips. Let me have a look at that, Desdemonia said, and removed Iris's bloody hand from his leg. A sigh. This is bad. She pulled aside some of the torn cloth from Iris's pant leg and revealed a deep gash that was oozing blood. A shard of volcanic rock was lodged firmly in his leg. If it wasn't removed, Iris would eventually bleed to death. His face was ashen already. I'll be fine, but keep moving. Don't wait for me if I can't keep up. Completing the quest is all that matters. I admire your courage, Iris, but we must remove that shard or you're not going anywhere, Desdemonia said. She grabbed some bandages from her rucksack. These will help, but that cut will not close without proper stitching. Des, do you have any more healing potions? Kasai said. Just one remains. I was saving it, though. Let's have it. What if... Come on, Des, he needs it now. What if you need it more? She blurted out the words. All eyes were on her now, though she had said what they must all be thinking. Eris held his hand up and pushed Desdemonia away. She's right. Just wrap me up, I'll be fine. Des, can you heal him? Kasai said. No, it's too deep. I could close it temporarily, but it will reopen easily. He needs a doctor. Or a healing potion. Kasai, she said, trying to think of another way. She looked to Pala for an answer, and he gently shook his head. His eyes told her enough. The last healing potion should be saved for Kasai. Yes, the potion, Kasai insisted. She reluctantly handed him the small vial. Run Run looked questioningly at his brother. The ever hero knows best, Run Run. It will be all right, Pala said, and knelt down next to Eris to take hold of the shard. Ready? Harris nodded and shut his eyes tight. Pala gave a quick pull and removed the rock. Kasai popped the stopper to the vial and fed the contents to Iris. Thankfully, the gash on Iris's leg closed quickly. Des, can you wrap him up? Kasai said. I'll do it, Oren said and moved to help Iris. He practically knocked her out of the way with his body. The Stemonia backed off and sat down in the snow, feeling frustrated and annoyed. Kasai had just done a foolish thing. She hoped she wasn't going to have to debate him on every wrong decision he wanted to make. Well, that's what I'm here for, she said in jest. 
The other's uncertain looks told her they questioned his judgment as well. It was a difficult choice, but a necessary one. Kasai was the most selfless person she had ever known. Hopefully they would find Aitana soon, and the great monk would make everything right. She craned her head to look up at the mountainous volcano. I hope we don't have to return the same way we arrived. Kasai eventually joined her. He gave her a brief smile before he sat down. I know, you don't have to say anything. That was very generous, if not very wise, she said anyways. I couldn't let him die, Des. Kasai watched Orin help Eris move about slowly. As I frowned when he saw Paolo and his brother Run Run exchanging hand signals. I hope they are talking about the lay of the land and the direction the party might travel next, Kasai sighed. He had pulled up his knees and rested his forehead on his arms. I don't know what I'm doing. I should have listened to you. I know. That was our last potion, she said and tried to keep the frustration out of her voice. No, I mean, when we were at Maurice's fortress, and you asked me to leave after losing Master Sugar. Oh, that, yeah, that would have been smart, too. We should have left when we had the chance, he shook his head in disappointment. I'm responsible for bringing that dreadful portal into existence. I'll let my anger rule my judgment. Des could see the weight of his words was like an avalanche crashing down on. You did what you thought was right. You have a good heart, Kasai. It's a noble feature. This is all a terrible mistake, he said. I'm not the one everyone needs me to be. What kind of ever hero would let something like that happen? Des didn't know what to say, so the two sat in silence. It's a wonder we made it this far, he said eventually, and we will make it the rest of the way, one step at a time until it's finished. I wish I had your confidence. Me too, handsome. Now, pick yourself up. You have a rescue party to lead. You're right, he said and got to his feet. Paolo, we must move on. Pell aroused the rest of the small party, and they resumed the trek to find Athenos. The snow swirled around them in a constant flirt for the next hour. Testimonia and Kasai caught up to Paolo as it trudged through the snow. The leader of the Kibo Gensai gave them both a somber nod. Do you think Run Run will be able to find our way back? I'm hopelessly lost already. Each step forward erases one from the past, Kasai said. We shall all find our way home, ever hero. The light of Athenos will guide us. I hope so, Kasai mumbled. The group moved onward, with Run Run and Oren taking the lead. Pallor dropped back to walk with Ares, the snow-filled wind blurring their shapes into dark shades. Nestimonia curled up tightly in a molochuk fur, hoping it would shield her against the biting winds. It helped a little, but not enough. Something is happening to me, Des. I feel as if I've walked these wastelands before. Nestimonia was quiet for a while. Something was happening to her, too. Do you think it has something to do with Aetanos and the Chaos Gate? How could it not? I have an uncanny insight directing me where to go, but not how to return. I feel so drained as if I haven't slept in weeks. I can't remember anything. There was a mountain, wasn't there? Because I turned around fast. Good, good. It's still there? Of course the mountain is still there. Where would it go? She was shouting again. This blasted wind. She could barely hear her own thoughts. I'm okay, I'm okay, Kasai said, but not to her. He was lost in his own world, rocking back and forth as they walked. Destimonia saw Orin trudging through the snow towards them. His eyes flashed with intensity at her, then became soft and weary as he addressed Kasai. Ever hero, we should rest and take food. Run Run has spotted shelter from the wind. There to the left. Fine, lead the way, Kasai said. The small party headed to the low hills area where natural upheavals of rock and ice built high snowdrifts on either side and created a buffer against the wind. Nestimonia was grateful to be on solid ground and not shin high in snow. The companions nestled themselves inside a small hollow of rocks and slowly ate the last of their rations. The salted food would have to be enough for what remained of their journey, but how long that would be, no one knew. Testimonia's body soaked up the sparse nutrients of the beef jerky. She felt a wave of perspiration flow out of her pores and was distraught to waste such a valuable resource. She would need to keep all the available water in her body to help stave off dehydration. The landscape was a tempestuous sea of icy snow and deep slush. 
The companions had no map or any precise knowledge of where Aetonos was located. Kasai pointed them in the basic direction, but he too seemed unsure. They were exhausted and lost in a desolate land. No one spoke, and only the howling wind could be heard, mocking them for their trespass. We must continue in this direction, Kasai said, pointing to the south, if there was south here. He tried to appear confident, but Desdemonia could tell he wasn't. How can you be sure of the way? Orin sputtered through chattering teeth. He held up a compass, and they all watched the directional needle dance and whirl endlessly. Palo cast a stern expression at the Kibukansai warrior. Desdemonia saw guilt in Orin's eyes. They all knew the compass had stopped functioning long ago. There was no magnetic north here, nor a consistent set of constellations anyone could see beyond the cloud-filled skies. In truth, I am not sure, Kasai lamented. I remember things that I couldn't possibly know. Kasai looked imploringly at the others for their understanding. The Kibo Kansai, especially Paolo, seemed to know more about the ways of the Everhero than he did. Trust in the Everhero, Orin. He need only follow his heart, Paolo interjected. I meant no disrespect. He bowed to Kasai and then to Paolo. Kasai just waved him away and slumped down where he stood. Estimonia was happy Paolo had intervened, or else she would have said something to put Orin in his place. Orin wasn't the friendliest of chaps, and she wasn't going to let his foul disposition get under Kasai's skin. He had too much to worry about already. She looked over at Kasai and smiled warmly at him. He raised his head and returned her gaze. She knew they were connected and shared a special bond together. Maybe she knew him in a previous awakened life. Whatever it may be, when this was finished, she would ask him again to return with her to the forest. They could find peace there and rest for his soul. Once they had freed Aetonos, the great monk would make everything right again. Do you think we will be there soon? Testimonia said to Kasai. She was grateful she didn't need to compete with the wind to be heard. If not, perhaps we should take a longer break. I'll be fine, Kasai said. His words were short. I don't need to be mothered. I'm sure you don't, Sir Hero, she said tersely at first, and then added with a quirky smile. I thought I might conjure up some ice bunnies in the snow and brighten up this dreary place. It certainly could do with a little fun and a wood witch's touch, Eris added with a smile. He put two fingers behind his head to mimic rabbit ears, but I wouldn't advise making a snack out of them. They may bite back, she said. Despite his downtrodden mood, Kasai couldn't suppress a chuckle and soon began to laugh. Paolo and Run Run did the same. Testimonia noticed they had the same sort of snorting laughter, and their bodies bobbled like children's toys. Only Orin remained glum. His grave eyes never left Kasai. <laughs> I feel like I'm dying, Kasai said while still laughing. But his mirth quickly ended. It's this horrible place. It's killing me, he said softly. The rest of the group looked at him in serious concern. You need rest, Kasai, Testimonia said. She put her arm around his shoulder so he could lean on her. He didn't resist. His body was shivering, and she hoped she had enough body heat for the two of them. My past is fading. I'm being replaced with memories of someone else's life. Testimonia noticed the interest of the Kibo Gansai peaked. You now walk in the steps of the Divine Fist, Paolo said. Ron Ron sat close to his brother and nodded enthusiastically. It is his memories you share. Aetonos? Impossible, Kasai said. I'm no hero. It's all a cruel joke. It was never supposed to be me. I'm nobody. His voice was barely a whisper. The Stimonad could feel the heaviness of his body sink into hers. Five. Kasai. The edges of Kasai's sight dimmed to dark shadows. He heard a distant voice pleading with him, but he didn't want to listen anymore. Why wouldn't they just let him sleep? Everything would be easier if he could only sleep. Kasai, wake up! We need you! He heard Desdemonia's voice getting louder. He felt her hands around his chest, lifting him up to a sitting position. Soon more hands were holding him, keeping him steady. The winds momentarily ceased their howls, as if waiting to observe his resolve. But there was only silence and doubt in his heart. There was no strength left in him to support the burden of his calling. 
be the ever hero, they all said. He didn't even know what that meant. Kasai? Kasai? Are you all right? Estimonia's voice was filled with concern. Des, I cannot do this task. I'm so tired. I cannot go on. Weight is too heavy, he mumbled. Kasai, we must try. I am here with you. Together we can win. Kasai looked deeply into Desdemonia's amber eyes and saw smoldering fire and determination. Okay, Des. Together. She grasped his hands. He rose, and his renewed purpose lingered in the air, a floating feather of determination ready to guide him. The next scale blasted its way into the natural shelter, and again he fell to the cold ground. Palo and Run Run exchanged nervous glances. The ever hero must rest. The misery of this realm has a greater effect on him, much more so than us, though I am amazed we have traveled so far. This horrid place is enough to drive any sane person mad, Palo said. I can stand, Kasai said, and tried to raise himself from the ground. His legs trembled with exhaustion and rebelled against another step. His mind willed him forward, but his body refused to be pushed further. Kasai slumped back into the snow. I'm sorry, I can't. Come, help me build a better shelter against the wind. Push snow closer to the taller rocks. We'll remain here the night, Palo said. If there is a night here. Kasai vaguely heard Palo's insistent order to the others. Working quickly, they soon had built up walls of snow and ice to divert the rushing winds. They huddled together for warmth, placing Kasai in the center. Kasai's thoughts drifted in and out of lucidity. Images filled his mind of a similar journey, traveled by another's footsteps in the deep snow. He felt as if he was in a dream. Kasai looked at his hands and saw they were now the hands of another, worn and weathered with calluses and scars. The great Molochuk fur had changed to a robe of cobalt blue, and he was moving. His bright blue cobalt robe was in sharp contrast to the shoulder-high snowdrifts that blocked his path and taunted him to bully his way through. He pushed forward, and the ice and snow dissolved before his feet. He stumbled awkwardly through what was no longer there. The snowdrifts scattered in all directions and formed again in a new location. He was alone on the icy tundra. The cold air burned his lungs as he pressed onwards. His mind wandered as the elements continued to test his willpower and resolve. By the immortal mother, I do not belong here. None of my kind does. He plowed through another snowdrift. This one remained thick and solid enough to tax his divine strength. He broke through with a final thrust. The snow quickly tapered down to a white powder dashed over a veil of thin ice. The ice shattered from the weight of his hard step, and a previously hidden crevice opened beneath him. The ground became a hole of black emptiness, and only his enhanced reflexes and tantric muscle control saved him from plummeting into a frozen grave. He leaped to the side and scrambled over the lip of the pit. He took a few steps away from the opening and sat down. He needed to be stable of mind to concentrate and regain control of his thoughts if he were to succeed in rescuing his beloved. It took a moment's respite to tap into the vast reservoir of fires into and thaw the deep shiver from his body. The past and present unleashed a spinning unreality that clouded his perception. He must stay true to his purpose for being here, in this living nightmare or his mind would break. Start again with the basics, he said. Something easy to hold on to and to build upon. My name. What is my name? I must have a name. Nothing. He had been given so many names in his time, and now he could not recall even one. Forget the past. Who am I now? Ka... Kasa? The name slipped through his mind as quickly as it had arrived. The location of the desolate volcano was now beyond his grasp. Had it been there, or was it another trick, courtesy of his increasingly deranged imagination? Had he already entered the frozen realm and descended the dead Goliath in triumph, or 
Was he, in fact, born of the ice and snow and had yet to ascend that fierce and terrible foe, a significant barrier preventing him from exiting this land and completing his quest? Was that crucial information lost to him now as well? No, I was not of this place, not of this time, nor shall I ever be. I did not belong here then or now. By all rights in the seven heavens, I should not be allowed to step into this hell at all. How then am I here? What mysterious journey has the immortal mother placed me on? Why was I chosen? There must be a reason I was sent here. The question perplexed him. He must have been given help to pass the Amerinthian barrier. But by whom? He had no recollection. The only answer was the howling wind and the madness given voice in the back of his mind, coaxing him to relent. Stop walking, old man. Sit. Meditate. Relax. Sleep. Surrender. Your journey is at last over, great monk. Concentrate, he shouted over the distracting winds, and to silence the voice haunting his mind. If I am alone, then my journey is not complete, and I am certainly alone in this wretchedness. I know Illyria is here. His visions had shown him that she was here, in pain. His reasoning was sound. He pushed back against the fog in his head and cleared some space for her image. He saw her bright face and the tenderness in her eyes, his angel. He held on to that image, and it gave him the strength to push onwards. He could not forsake her. He would not. The wind died down momentarily. He scanned the horizon and realized he was hopelessly lost. There were no landmarks to gauge the distance he had covered. There was only emptiness. Small hills of snow rose in a hasty fury and then were blown asunder. None of that mattered. He would rely on a different compass to guide his way. His angel had placed a craving in his heart long ago and it directed his steps now. He relied solely on that compulsion to guide him. Somehow the chaotic winds could not keep the smell of her scent from him and the memories of the passion they had shared together. Why she had left him one day without cause or reason vexed him still. Oh, he knew it could not last, not with her. They were just too different. She had wanted to change him and succeeded most profoundly. His ascension into the ranks of the heavenly host was a miracle. However, the core of his human heart remained the same, and that was their downfall. He could not wholly ascribe to the strict loss of the seven heavens. He could not forsake his mortal brethren and their struggle to understand the boundaries of the path of righteousness. There was too much real life in the gray shadows of human understanding and desire. Over time, he had learned to forget her. Or rather, mask the heartache and became obsessed with higher aspirations and noble deeds. Many in the mortal realm heard his song, a message of joy and peace throughout the land, and it lifted their hearts and caressed their souls. But little by little, she would creep back into his consciousness, a soft whisper to excite the imagination of what might be. And then, all at once, he felt her addictive pull. It crashed through his meditations and distracted his will. She had become ever-present in his dreams and encompassed his thoughts once more. He saw her in a dreamlike haze between his thoughts, just out of reach of his physical sight, but real nonetheless. And now she called him again. It must have cost her much to communicate with him in this manner. Over such distance, through the realms, he would honor that sacrifice. Illyria was reaching out to him to rescue her, to set her free. He forgot his song, and the lands of mortals went silent while he searched desperately for her. He would find her. She needed him. He pushed on into the cold. Dark thoughts surrounded his mind and lashed out at him for being so weak. Is this what I have become? The young pup. Desperate for a morsel of attention, tossed at his feet from the mother's daughter. Does each savory bite only serve to drive the hunger harder and yearn for the next taste? He said aloud, trying to understand who he was. I am the greatest grandmaster of them all. 
I have transcended the ways of all earthly desires, and I have ascended into the divine. He paused in his ravings. No, I'm... that no longer. I, I'm just a man with a heart that yearns for love and belonging. The madness swarmed into his mind and made him blind. I am but a humble servant, set in this world to give fully of myself and endure. There is nothing for me to possess. I was made to give, always to give. He pressed on, trudging through deep snow. The warm glow of Illyria's soul was the only beacon for him to follow in the deep, dark places where his mind had become a prisoner. He had never been in love with any one thing before, for after his transcendent ascension, his passion touched all beings. His love was unconditional and equal, but with her it was different. The enticement of her call was bewitching. She had possessed his every thought and drove him into frenzied action, regardless of how foolish. He knew he did it willingly, always searching for her approval. Approval? Who was she that he needed her approval? His muse? His lover? He did not know. She was the angel Illyria, and that was enough for him. He let the unanswered questions float behind him and scatter into the breeze. The thin layer of surface ice crunched under his steps as each leg fell thigh deep into the thick, wet snow. It sucked at his legs as he took the next step, refusing to let go. The visions his inner sight showed him spoke of being nowhere and everywhere at once. Visions had a mysterious and vague language of their own, and this place fit that description perfectly. The abyss had entirely claimed this once beautiful land. Therefore, being lost was relative, and he assured himself that he would know when he reached his goal by the clarion call in his heart. Confident in his clarity of purpose once more, he pushed on against the maddening howl of the wind and the ever-shifting snow. His steps became less muffled upon the ankle-deep snow, and he grew more confident that the terrain underfoot had changed for the better. He could capture lost time due to the more favorable footing. The blinding snow had created a seamless transition between frozen land and frozen lake. The shrieking wind had drowned out all sound, except for its devilish course, until he heard the heavy moan of ice breaking. Deep cracks spun off in multiple patterns beneath his feet. He contemplated their beauty, just before the ground dissolved into an icy death trap. He plunged into a new horror, as frigid water opened beneath him and eagerly slurped him down into its depth, his mind registered the danger instantly, and his body went into a blur of motion. He pushed off the solid block of ice, still underfoot, and leaped for the far side. The unstable ground compromised his efforts, and what should have been an easy leap turned into a sinking wade through icy slush. He sank down deeper into darkness. The numbness was a quick shock to his senses. With one last, desperate effort, he launched himself upwards, like a cobalt scale koi, propelling itself out into the open air towards the far bank. Kasai came awake with a start. Destimony and the Kibogan Sai surrounded him, all huddled closely around him, resting as best they could. Destimony looked at him with sleepy tenderness. I hope you were dreaming of me, handsome. Kasai smiled. He appreciated the flirtatious gypsy in her affable charm. How long? Kazai asked as he began to get up. Only a few hours, Paolo said, the relief on his face evident. We are ready to continue, Orin said, as if answering the question in Kasai's mind. If the ever hero is willing. Kasai received a determined nod from Desdemonia as well. Kasai took a deep breath. The cold burned his lungs, but it also made him more alert. I think so, Kasai said. He shook the lingering dream of walking in another's footsteps from his head. He hoped it meant they were at least going in the right direction. They collected their belongings and left the shelter. The low hills eventually relented to barren flatlands and the glacial plain, which stretched out endlessly to all horizons. They were alone, wanderers in a desolate wasteland. 
insignificant specks adrift in a forever-changing landscape of swirling white winds and frigid misery. They walked in silence for hours. Terrible squalls spread frozen debris into Kasai's face, creating a spectacle of hallucination and delirium. The fierce wind relentlessly buffered and berated him. Fool! Kasai heard the word carried on the wind, and not for the first time. Mocked him, laughed and jeered at him for thinking he could succeed. What was he but an insignificant monk who had mistakenly been chosen for greatness that belonged to another? His resolve broke. He fell once more and felt the cold, sharp kiss of the hard snow as it died into his knees. I am the fool was damned the world, Kasai said and shook his head in disbelief. I am only a monk, just a simple, stupid monk. Kasai's strength ebbed away, and he sank deeper into the cold embrace of dispassionate snow. His mind drifted back to the dream of a giant cobalt koi jumping out of a frozen pond. Miraculously, he grabbed a tiny handhold, a nub of ice no bigger than the tip of a finger, but it was enough. He wrapped his callous hand around it and reinforced his hold with his thumb. Slowly, he pulled himself from the black water, his saturated robes heavy with slush. He was thankful to be back on stable ground, but now he had a new problem. He was drenched and would soon be encased in a cocoon of ice. His body temperature had already dropped significantly. The desire to panic crept into his thoughts like a slow, stealthy hunter. He sat for a moment and willed his mind to remain calm. He needed to marshal his thoughts. Time was slipping away. He scanned the horizon again, looking for any slight indication that he was closer to his destination, but saw nothing that revealed he had made any progress at all. He sighed with despair. He then spotted a high snowdrift that would serve his more immediate need. He backtracked where the snow was deeper and climbed up a snowbank. His body ached and his skin itched as if a thousand pins repeatedly stabbed into his flesh. The sensation of pain gave him hope. If he could still feel, then he was still alive and would endure. He reached the summit and slowly excavated out a deep hole from the middle and dropped inside. The fierce wind howled above his head as he stripped off his outer blue robe, boots, and undergarments. He had little time to waste. He sat naked in the center of his temporary refuge and cleared his mind. Hypothermia stalked him like a starved tundra wolf. It waited patiently for its prey to succumb to the exhaustion of the hunt. Its packmates, doubt and misery, were constant adversaries in his mind. They nipped at his heels whenever he regained focus of his mission. It was only a matter of time, even for one of his enhanced endurance. He couldn't survive in this wasteland forever. The nature of the place exerted a special tax upon his divine essence. His entire body was racked with cold and shivered uncontrollably. He closed his eyes and forced his mind to concentrate. Be calm, for life is a willing extension of energy within the multiverse. A gift is given freely and returned without remorse. This is the boundless. Law and chaos are the twin strangers, each forcing and encouraging the other to grow. Each gave and received the other's special blessing. The gift of the multiverse is within me, and I will use it to grow as well. I will add myself to the great expanse and become one with the boundless. He said the soothing words through chattering teeth, activating his four Zindu energies and calling forth the glowing fire within his soul. Gradually, he felt his heart beating to a new rhythm, one that was at peace with his circumstance, accepting it as temporary and not forever. He was not filled with pain or consumed by panic. His heart beat slowly and steadily in his chest. It thumped louder with each controlled breath and eventually drowned out the shrieking winds outside his snow ditch. His body began to summon warmth from the surrounding pockets of invisible Zindu energy that existed even here in this cold and barren hell. Some of it he gave freely from his inner core. Some of it he borrowed from the boundless, creating a balanced harmony of giving and receiving. His skin felt wet as the thin glaze of ice sloughed off his body and puddled in the creases of his crossed limbs. As the heat expanded from his body, the inner sanctum glowed amber, and steam rose from his flesh. 
the shivering ceased, and his body relaxed for the first time since he had entered Gothos. His inner fire blazed on, and soon his skin dried, followed by his clothing. What had started as a warm, kindled flame now flared red-hot with fervor. The walls of his shelter began to melt. He needed to quench the insatiable hunger of his fires into, or he would be lost to the flame. Slowly, gently, he tapped into his waters into to buffer the inner inferno he had created. His fires into understood and relented to a warming furnace. He was still in control, always the master. After a short rest, he dressed and climbed out of his ice shelter to resume his journey. An icy gale blew up from behind him and shot past him as it raced mindlessly across the barren snowdrifts. A wild banshee screaming out her madness, unhindered by rock or tree or hill. It slammed its eerie might into a distant, solitary spire, spraying snow and ice upon its sleek black surface. The lone tower rose out of the ground, a slender finger of contempt against the arctic elements. The citadel had stood for millennia and would continue to do so until time itself was cast into oblivion. He had found the entrance to Furia Keep at last, the dreadful place that held his dear Illyria captive. The stronghold radiated an aura of gloom and despair to rival the frigid temperatures outside, but to the man in the cobalt blue robes it was a beacon of hope. He stood to take in its preternatural magnificence. Somewhere inside, the completion of his quest would be found. He knew it was a forsaken place, yet it was the destination of his journey, the one he had sought without map or guide. It had been part of his dreams, and it called to him as Illyria had called to him, a siren in the cold dark. No matter the immortal mother's plan for him, he would do this one thing for himself. He would save her. Time was once more his enemy, not direction. He knew he had pushed his inner fires into the limit, and for far too long. However, he willed it on, knowing it was slowly consuming his essence for the fuel it needed to keep burning. It was now the only thing keeping him alive, albeit barely. He looked longingly at the distant spire, watching it blur in and out of focus through wet eyes. A flurry of snow whipped up and eclipsed the tower. When it had passed, a hazy figure, shimmering in the distance, had taken its place. As the shade approached, he could make out the curved outlines of a woman's figure, naked against the elements. Her hair danced wildly in the air and fought back against the blizzard of snow and ice swarming around her. He squinted against the furious snow squall, not trusting what he saw. When his eyes cleared, she had vanished into the blinding white. Push on. Just take one more step forward. Keep warm, regardless of the cost. I'm coming. He had nothing more to give. His fires into had continuously raged for what must have been days or months or years. He could no longer tell. Lyria, he whispered her name to make sure he remembered. His legs folded beneath him and crunched into the shallow snow. He fell into darkness. Kasai picked himself up off the frozen ground once more. It was difficult to decipher what was his present reality and what was a borrowed memory. The ever-present swirling snow prevented his mind from recognizing the difference between the two. Kasai saw a vast area in the distance that glowed with a distinct ashen emerald hue, and his heart filled with dread. He stood like a statue in the snow, and absent-mindedly brought his hand to his chest. He felt the area with a brand from the cursed amulet had left its mark on him in Raklak Fortress, and thereby established the soul bridge needed to open the horrific chaos gate. The dead bodies of trampled slaves littered the land surrounding the diabolical gateway. They were buried in the frozen ground at different depths. Some were locked in place at their ankles, while others were buried up to the ridge of their nose. Their souls were given up as a sacrifice to appease the cosmic forces that require payment for passage. Seca had already marched her demon horde through the Chaos Gate and into Barokia. Kasai realized the demons had stomped on the immobile slaves as they crossed over the ground and into the portal, leaving the wretched bodies broken and wallowing in small frozen pools of maroon. All were dead. The incessant wind caked ice and snow around them, incorporating their bodies into their desolate terrain. 
three kingdoms of Hanna were doomed. All hope left Kasai, and his mind sought to escape from this nightmare. He could not go on. He had failed. Kasai, you found it! The Chaos Gate! Desdemonia was there at his side once more, but Kasai could barely hear her words. The weight of his misguided deeds overwhelmed him. He couldn't breathe, nor did he want to expend the effort to try. Des moved in front of him and shook him. He knew she was shouting at him, but he could no longer hear her words. Was she berating him for bringing her here to die? She should have left him and Master Shogar to the savage chaos beasts and not bothered to rescue them. Then she would still be safe. Kasai thought he heard another whispered voice. Look! There! Movement! It was one of the Kibo Gansai. Kasai thought his name might be Aris, but he couldn't be sure. Everything around Kasai was a dense fog. Aris, if that was his name, looked as if he was shouting and pointing excitedly at something in the distance. Kasai couldn't concentrate. He shivered so severely that his teeth rattled in his head. It was the only thing he could hear as his eyes rolled back into his head. Sleep. I must sleep, he thought. Someone was shaking him. His eyes opened to slits. It was Desdemonia holding him firmly. Fire Zindu! Kasai, listen to me. Use your fire, Zindu. She was trying to say something else. She grabbed Nins' cedar from his sash and held the fire serpent up to his eyes. She can't do that, he thought. No one can hold her but me. Kasai barely acknowledged what she meant and took Nins' cedar in his hands. Immediately, the fire serpent locked within him, called to him, imploring him to come back, to rejoin the fight of righteousness. The ancient weapon thrust her energy into his body. Kasai was pulled out of his fugue state to the maddening howls of the frigid winds. Ninsasida graciously kept a steady flow of vital energy flowing into him, and he regained some of his strength. Thank you, Ninsasida. You do me a great honor. The weapon pulsed back a reply in his mind. We are not finished. Kasai saw movement to the right side of the portal, as three small creatures harried a broken slave bound to an X-shaped crucifix. They crawled over his body like vermin. His head was low and his body seemed broken, held up only by the support of the crucifix. Then Zazita flared to life in his hands, and Kasai felt as if the fire serpent was expressing joy. Eat in us! Then Zazita shouted her elation in his mind. You have found the master! Six. Shiverick. Shiverick woke with a lithe succubus wrapped around his body. The smells of the lovemaking, if one could call it that, still lingered in the air. He enjoyed her changeling appearances, which added unique twists to their coupling. Sestra now shared his bed whenever she deigned to make an appearance in the capital city of Krokal, which had become more frequent since the arrival of Sekka and her Frost Legion to the mortal realm. The air that swept through the streets and alleyways of Quakal was noticeably colder since his coup and the death of King Conrad. It will be an early winter this season, thought Shivering. The city had been shut down to locate and punish the dissenters to his new regime. After a quick trial, the accused were hung in the local squares for treason. The dead weight of the bodies, gently swaying in the chilly breeze, was a grim reminder to would-be sympathizers to the House of Conrad. Frost would cover the cold bodies overnight and melt away in the afternoon sun. The things I do, I do for the good of Barokia. The rats must be driven from their dens. It's the only way to align the people to a more structured rule, Shiverick said. It's what my grandsire would have done. Shiverick expected there would be a time of unrest before the general populace embraced him as their new ruler. However, he grew tired of expending time and resources to quell the public fear or to quash a new uprising of a smaller noble house looking to advance its position in the new hierarchy of rulership in Quakal. The nature of his blood demanded conquest, and he felt the eyes of his forefathers bearing down on him in impatient judgment. He needed to unify Barokia before Sekka became too entrenched in the Three Kingdoms. 
the disputes of the lesser houses were delaying his plans. She regazed at Cestra's lithe figure draped over his own. She was a welcome addition to his warm bed. To many she seemed but a child by her appearance, and they were the fools for thinking such. The demon was ancient. She idly wondered if one of her kind needed sleep or just pretended. He found he didn't care. The succubus was an enjoyable distraction, but nothing more. He had grander things to conquer than mounting an overly sexed creature from the abyss. Sestra had tactical information he needed regarding Sekka and her frost legion, but the succubus was not forthcoming with anything of value, and he needed an advantage. Shivrig heard nearby movement. He peered into the half-light of the room to see Kalkaroth hunkered down in the shadows, mumbling to himself. The pale demon was always present when Sestra returned to the castle keep. He lurked nearby, shifting his weight on his haunches like a hungry watchdog, waiting to be fed. Go find yourself another toy to worry over, Kalkaroth, and leave this chamber. Your presence here is unwelcome, Shivrig said as he left the bed and dressed in a morning robe. Haunt someone else's dreams. I shall go and stay where I please, mortal, Kalkaroth said as the hackles rose on his back. Shivrig knew it didn't take much provocation to anger the demon, and he was in no mood for an argument or a fight. Stay then, pretend the succubus holds any desire for you. Kalkaroth's growl rumbled in his chest. The succubus stirred seductively under the sheets of the grand bed, but did not rise. Shivrig knew she was awake and enjoyed the tension between him and the pale demon. He noticed Kalkaroth stared longingly at Sestra, and suspected Daku, the young monk from Ordu, continued to fight for his soul, somewhere within the confines of the demon's vast bulk. Sestra had tricked Daku into ingesting a demon seed, holding the essence of Kalkaroth. Once swallowed, the beast within could then possess the soul of its human host. Kalkaroth lowered himself on his haunches and began mumbling to himself again. Shivrig did not understand the language he spoke, but assumed it was the infernal tongue of Gathos. Mostly, Shivrig caught Kalkaroth unaware, arguing with himself in the corner of a room or the shadows of a long hall. The demon's facial features would subtly shift in the gloom from a bear-like snout with bestial eyes to the human face of a young man. Shivrig was impressed. The monks of order were renowned for their exceptional abilities and disciplined minds. A new level of respect formed in Shivrik's mind for the young monk. Daku remained a thorn in the demon's side. Shivrik wondered if a human could completely break the bonds of a demonic possession and maintain control of the shared soul. Shivrik knew he would never succumb to possession of any sort. He would die first. I see Daku is not as weak of mind and spirit you had initially assumed. Watching you lose control amuses me, Shivrig said, testing his theory. His soul is mine. The monk is forever lost. Kalkaroth rose to a towering height. Shivrig was instantly on guard for an attack, but instead of lunging forward, the pale demon lumbered out of the room, knocking over a small statue on a pedestal when he left. Sestra had said when a mortal ingests a demon seat, the demon held within the pod would forever be bound to that human soul, but she did not say which of the two retained control once established. Interesting that she left out that crucial bit of information. The battle over Daku's mind and soul proved to be an essential experiment to observe. If a mortal could take the demon seat and retain his conscious mind, but command the demon's superior strength and reflexes, it would make for an unstoppable soldier. Shivri could train them to be a cohesive fighting machine, unlike the failures of his ancestors with breeding ogres and humans together. Hopefully this would produce different results. Everything has a weakness, Shivri said. Everything. I just need to find it. There could be only one ruler of Barokia, and all of Hannah for that matter, and Shivrig was determined to ensure that its ruler was mortal. He recalled a conversation he had with his man Pathias after the battle at the last garrison. The weakness of a purebred demon horde is its leader. The warlord is the force that holds the monsters together as a singular unit, 
If the warlord falls, the structure of the horde became undone, and the bloodlust of the individual takes over. I watched demons fall upon their own when their leader was destroyed. Destroyed? How? Shivrick dug deeper and listened with great interest to Pathia's report. A lone monk took the field and engaged the enemy's warlord when the rest of the king's army was in retreat. Amazingly, he was without armor or support of men. I watched in keen interest as the two battled. There was a flash, and the warlord fell, headless. And the whereabouts of the monk? Shivrig wondered if the monk who killed the warlord was the same one Dax referred to as the ever-hero. Could the myth be true? Rubbish. War made a man's wits leave him quicker than a fish released from the fisherman's hook. It was more likely that a misplaced missile took the warlord's head rather than anything a single monk could do. I do not know, my lord. Once the warlord was destroyed, the demon horde splintered, and I was hard-pressed by the foe. Chopping the head from the snake was the key to a decisive victory, as long as fear didn't overwhelm his men. He wondered how to train against the demons without alerting Sestra, Kalkaroth, or even the rarely seen Dax to his agenda. His men were not ready for the likes of Kalkaroth, and the demon would surely kill his men first before relenting when they went down. Shiverick thought more about the mixture of Kalkaroth and Daku. The beast was formidable to behold, but had the disposition of a petulant child. He was moody and unpredictable, where the monk possessed a rational and disciplined mind, one that could develop complex thoughts and contingent strategies during a raging battle. Perhaps an average soldier would not possess the same depth of understanding as a monk of Ordu. Still, divisions of foot soldiers and spearmen were needed in battle, the same as competent generals. What was the key to control, he wondered. The answer flitted like a gnat buzzing in his ear, but just out of reach when he tried to catch it. Shivering would keep the pale demon under surveillance and always have one of Malachi's men watching him. Hopefully none of them would be killed in the process. The world was changing. No longer would mundane weapons be enough to conquer and hold new lands. The threat from the abyss was real. He needed to have a powerful force of his own that could match the demons in combat. Seka has a plan for this realm. Shivrig paced the floor of the chamber where he had received his closest advisors, Duke Manda, Lord Fritta, and his arch Vashim, Malachi. They all nodded in agreement. Shivrig continued. I am no fool. She will not stop it soon. Seka will eventually come for Barokia. Control of Hannah must be her ultimate objective, and I intend to be an obstacle in her way. She will need to remove me. Perhaps your choice of allies was misguided. You have vanquished an enemy of the realm in one hand only to raise a stronger one with the other, Duke Manda said. But if the Archdevil wants conquest, why would she not immediately march on the capital city? She must know the realm is in chaos, Lord Fritta said. The lands north of the Hoarfrost Mountains lack immediate building resources, fertile soil, or a significant populace to warrant an invasion. There is no reason for her to stay there. However, for the same reason, why would she pursue soon? Scouting or merchant reports dating back hundreds of years speak of a land of dense jungles holding a few pockets of scattered indigenous tribes. There is nothing for her there but jungles and more jungles. It makes no sense. Shivrig weighed the logic of Lord Fritta's assumption. Gaining a foothold in a land protected by the Serebi Mountains will be a sound strategy. Its passes are few and its peaks are treacherously high, guarding her against a flash invasion. But why take a frost legion to an uncomfortably hot and humid environment when Trosk and its eternal winter is available? She would be better served to consolidate her strength there rather than soon, Fritta added. You must stop thinking as men of conquest and question what does an archdevil of the abyss need? Is she looking for land, resources, gold? That seems unlikely, Malachi said. We are ill-equipped to deal with this menace. Access to this land should never have been given to that devil, Lord Fritter said as he sat back in his chair, folding his arms across his chest. Gentlemen, we have been over this before. Seca will be removed in time. 
It was a binding pact made at a different time. I will break it as soon as we are ready. Trust me, Shiverick said. Morale was slipping, and he needed a victory soon to keep his co-conspirators' minds occupied. Slaves would be an ideal choice, Malachi added, the words salaciously leaving his mouth. Soul slaves, to be more precise. His eyes bore into Lord Manda, anticipating a reply. We are all in agreement. Soon is an unknown, and has been since the founding of Barokia. The overload Barak Shivering stopped his armies at the steps of the southern Sarabi Mountains, for reasons only he understood when he turned his energy back towards subjugating the newly conquered tribes, Shivering said. But if Sekka wants it, we should understand why, and if necessary, take it from her. Agreed, Lord Fritta said. Shiver nodded at Fritta's wisdom. I shall strengthen trade routes and use the merchants as reconnaissance agents. I do not want to alarm our new friends of any unfavorable duplicity. We will secretly establish diplomatic relations with Soon and act as their comrade in arms against the demon horde. With any luck, we shall have a united force before Seca knows of our... Sestra sauntered lazily into the room and languidly lounged on a red divan placed along the wall. Shivering frowned at her interruption, wondered how much she had heard. Lord Fritta and Duke Manda both exchanged uneasy looks of discomfort. Her appearance excited Malachi, but he soon regained his composure and addressed the lords of the realm. Unification of Barokia is far from complete, my lords. There is still much to accomplish in Quokal alone, not to mention the realignment of the lesser houses that remain loyal to the House of Conrad. Fear alone will not calm their hearts. Individually they are not a threat, but united they will be problematic. They will fight like corded badges if their livelihood remains in flux. They need to see a unity of purpose from the crown and, more importantly, the coin of the realm to flow. You will need their support to rule effectively. Sestra sighed aloud and impatiently picked herself up off the lush divan and strolled leisurely to Shiverick's side. She made sure she had Malachi's eye and watched him become noticeably flushed as she moved past him. You mortals have such limited thinking. So much talk, talk, talk about trade and loyalty and history. Such a bore, Sestra said. The means for total conquest of the kingdom Rokia, or any other kingdom you desire, is already at your disposal. Shivig looked at the succubus and raised his eyebrows in surprise and interest. Go on, he said. I have told you. The mistress Seca has already expressed her interest in you to lead her frost legions in the mortal realm. You would be unstoppable. Lord Fritter and Duke Manda looked questioningly at Shivery. The succubus had a knack of stirring fears and anxieties whenever she spoke. Shiverick, you caught the devil we wish to dispose of. Where is your sanity? Lord Fritta shook his head in disbelief. Shiverick held his hand up to calm Fritta's troubled thoughts. The price is too great. I would not taint the purity of the Shiverick line with demon blood or possession. Hasn't it already suffered diffusion of purity with the ogre races of long ago? Duke Manda said with a superior air of disdain. Peasant fables, nothing more, Shivering lied. Sestra rolled her eyes, unconvinced. She approached Shivering and draped her slender arms over his broad shoulders. She pulled his head down to hers and spoke plainly in his ear. My dear Garen, the demon seed shall set you free. Think of the power you shall wield over mortal and immortal beings alike. And become a slave to a demon like the young monk from Ordu. Do you take me for a fool? My legacy shall not be tainted. My star rises now, and I will build on this momentum, as the lords of my great house did long ago. He pulled away from her embrace. You misunderstand. Each seat is as different as the demonic essence that was bonded to it. Are you trying to tell me that the demon seed containing Kalkaroth wasn't meant for me? I find that hard to believe. Of course it was meant for you. But that was before we knew of your strength and resourcefulness. The mistress has greater things planned for you. 
Where the coup failed, you shall prevail. Shivering, explain yourself. What is this succubus implying? Lord Fritter said. He was a careful and cautious man who did not enjoy surprises. You all should partake in the demon seed and rid yourself of this frail shell you called mortality. The succubus looked at each in turn and stopped to leer at Lord Fritter, causing the strong man to lower his eyes. That's enough, Shivering said, annoyed at the disruption. If you have nothing of import to add, you may leave. The succubus swished her tail like a lazy snake in the warm sun and walked from the room. 7. Kasai Kasai rushed ahead of the others as Ninza's Zeta flared to life. Her ancient fire Zindu flowed freely into Kasai and gave him renewed strength and energy. Thank you, Ninza Zeta, for the gift of your warmth. Let us free Aetanos and leave this desolate place. Three smallish demons, resembling gross, hairless felines with the lower extremities of bloated slugs, molested Aetanos' frost-covered body. Their fat tails left gooey trails of mucus as they slithered and crawled over his chest, legs, and shoulders. And as Azita's fiery light caught their attention, and they turned to hiss at Kasai, the demons sprung from Aetanos' body at him. But Ninza Zeta snapped out at each one in quick succession and immolated the things in midair. Fetid smoke from their burning bodies rose in the air as the Kasai rubbed the remains out with his foot. Oh, disgusting, Kasai gasped. The air reeked of sulfur and rotten eggs. His eyes watered as he put the nook of his arm up to his face to cover his mouth and nose. The wind did nothing to blow the stench away. Kasai gently tapped Aetanos hoping to wake him from his stupor. Master Aetanos, we are here. Master, wake up. But Aetanos didn't move, even when nudged by Ninza Zeta's righteous flame. Kasai panicked, fearing the worst. Oh no, oh no, Master Aetanos. Kasai stood face level to the great monk and shook him with more urgency. Aetanos' exposed skin was ashen beneath a pattern of nasty bruises and angry welts. Dried blood was caked like frozen mud across his beaten body. Is he dead? Testimonia said. She was out of breath when she joined Kasai. Palo was close behind. Both slowly came to a stop as they saw the lifeless condition of the great monk. Testimonia put her hand on Aetanus' outstretched wrist, searching for life. She stepped back quickly in alarm. He's so cold. She cast a spell, and a blue swirl of magic wrapped around Aetanus' body, but dissipated in the wind. Something is blocking me. Aetanos' head hung heavy on his chest. Kasai heard a slight moan and gently lifted his head. A hollow pit where one night had been destroyed gaped hauntingly at him. The other eye was closed, sealed tight with frozen mucus. Run Run Aeris and Orin kept back and formed a perimeter around the party to guard against attack. They each glanced back at the crucified monk and exchanged anxious looks with one another. Heal him, Ninza Sita shouted in Kasai's mind. I don't know how, Kasai said. The others looked at him questioningly. Quickly, Kasai didn't think. He reacted to Ninza Sita's command and instinctively placed his hand on Aethon's chest above his heart. Give, and the boundless will share the same. Somehow, even with all he had forgotten since entering Gothos, Kasai remembered the image of a tall oak tree and a little boy crying at its roots. The boy had fallen from a high branch and held his ankle tightly. He looked up through watery eyes to see his mother kneeling down in front of him. She wrapped his ankle with some clean bandages and then hugged him close. An incredible feeling of love and care washed over Kasai, and he channeled that warmth into Aetanos. Aetanos stirred. He let out a long moan and his head swayed from side to side. Kasai stepped back as a faint light radiated from Aetanus' body, and the membrane of frost that previously coated him sloughed off. The whiteness of his skin took on a rosier complexion. Kasai wiped away the mucus covering Aetanus' remaining eye. The eyelid fluttered open, and he looked in one direction and then the next. Aetanus examined each of them suspiciously. Then he dropped his head back to his chest. Haunt me no more, demons. Your cruel work is complete. I am undone. Master Aetanos, I'm Kasai. 
Aetinus did not raise his head. Kasai scanned the trapping that bound Aetinus, searching for a way to release him from the crisscrossed beams. He was horrified to see the steel bolts nail into Aetinus' flesh. Be gone, demon. Leave me to my sorrow, Aetinus whispered in resignation. Kasai backed away from Aetinus. He glanced at Desdemonia, hoping she would know what to do. Kasai, try again, Desdemonia implored him. He has become lost in his mind. Help him find his way back. Kasai nodded, searching for something to jar Aetinus from his delirium. Master, it's Kasai, from Ordu, the mountain monastery. You call to me. I am your ever-hero. Kasai felt awkward saying the words. Aetinus slowly raised his head and focused on Kasai. A broad grin expanded across his face. Ah! It is you. I knew you would find a way, Aetina said with a sigh of relief. Help me get him down, Kasai called to the others. Palo cut the straps that bound Aetina's, but the bolts were another matter. Iris, Orin, and Runrun carefully removed Aetina's from the X-shaped cross, firmly pulling his arms free, then his legs. It was a painful process. They helped him to the ground while Desdemonia rummaged through a supply bag. She found some clean bandages and wrapped them around Aetinus' wounds and covered the open eye socket of his damaged eye. You are still very hurt, she said, scrutinizing Aetinus' tortured body. But better now than before, Aetinus said with a genuine smile. He stood on his own and stretched as if he had just woken from a long sleep. Kasai was filled with awe and relief. Come here, all of you. There is much we must discuss, Aetinus said. The group came in closer and listened to the great monk's urgent orders. Illyria needs me. She's imprisoned in the deepest dungeons of Fury I keep. Come with me, ever hero. Help me save my beloved. Aetinus took a step but sank to one knee on the next. Perhaps a bit of rest first, then. The Kibuk and Sai lowered themselves to the ground beside Aetinus. They each bowed their head to the snow in reverence. The light of Aetinus protects. Paolo said, and shall guide me through the darkness of my fears. Eris and Orn completed the simple prayer in unison. Up, up, stand, my new friends. The ground is hard and cold, Aetinus implored the Kibo Gensai as he raised himself, albeit on wobbly legs. He waved his hands in a sweeping fashion for the Kibo Gensai to follow, but the warriors did not rise. Aetinus looked concerned. What are you doing down there? Aetinos crouched back to the ground and began searching around in the crusty snow. Did you lose something? Is it shiny? We are humbled in your presence, great one, Paolo said with his head only slightly raised from the snow. Huh? What's this? Nothing lost? Aetinos kneeled in the snow, his body upright and hands on his hips. His expression was perplexed. Where am I? Why am I kneeling in the snow? Aetinos looked closely at Kasai and the others, as if seeing them for the first time. Who are you people? Master Aetinos? Kasai said worriedly. Aetinos pointed his finger at Kasai. You. I know you, don't I? Aetinos squinted his one eye at Kasai to see him more clearly. It's so hard to remember anything here. He looked at the bandages on his wrist. What happened here? He then saw the empty X-beams. Oh, that's a nasty-looking thing. The Kibug and Sai continued to prostrate themselves before the great monk. We have searched for the light for many years, great one. We have finally found you. Oren spoke as if he was unworthy to utter the words. Oh, Balderdash, get up, you fools, and stop your groveling. Aethanus pointed to the remains of the smoking demons. His expression turned sour and scrunched up his nose. He stink. He looked about as if searching his mind for answers. Did the immortal mother send you? Is that why I'm kneeling in the snow? Was I groveling? The keyboard and Sai rose, and all took an awkward step back in the snow, looking confused and fearful. Aetinos rose and approached Kasai. I don't suppose you have another one of those warm furs I could wear? It's quite chilly out here. The great monk wore a sheepish smile and wrapped his arms around his naked chest, acting to ward off the cold. Yes, of course, Master Aetinus, 
Kasai dug through a spare pack and gave Aetinos the grey mullachuk fur that would have been Rafar's had he still lived and made the journey to Gathos. Kasai felt a massive weight leave his shoulders. Finally, he had found the demigod. Illyria would call for them and Aetinos would fix everything. He had fulfilled his promise. Now a real hero could save them, and he could go back to his peaceful life. First, he would rebuild order in memory of his dead brothers, then maybe even join Death in her forest for a time. Master, your light has never been needed more. You must stop Sekka. Aetinus paused, as if unsure who Kasai spoke of or what it meant. Then realization sprang to his face. Oh, no, 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 that old devil Sekka is your concern, not mine. He repeatedly poked Kasai in the chest. Me? You are the ever hero, after all. The great monk gave Kasai a wink. I have other matters to attend. I must save my beloved. You are all welcome to join me, of course. It has been an age since I have had any decent company. Aetinus looked all around as if trying to get his bearings. Now, could one of you point me in the direction of Furia Keep? Aetinus looked at Kasai and then testimony of her input. Kasai saw the blank expression on Desdemonia's face and felt his own must be a mirror of disbelief. No, Aetinus said, then addressed the Kibukan Sai with his hands on his hips. What about you, lads? Ideas? Come now, it's cold out here, we'd best get a move on. Eris slowly raised his hand and pointed behind Aetinus. Is that it? Ah, there's a clever boy. That's it, indeed. Kasai's heart sank. None of this was what he had expected. Master, I can't defeat Sekka alone. I tried once, and look at the results. His eyes went to the festering chaos gate. Aetinus gazed at the portal and nodded his head in understanding. His face grew somber when he saw the trampled bodies surrounding it. The immortal mother knows best. The design of her eternal tapestry is mysterious and grand. All will be revealed in its own time. Aetinus spoke in barely a whisper, as if he remembered something vague and lost. But somehow Kasai heard his words. Desdemonia moved closer to Kasai. What is he saying? Does he know a better way back? We should keep moving. There are bound to be other, more dangerous things along soon, she said. Oh, hello there, Aetinus said in a sing-song voice. He bowed deeply to Desdemonia as if seeing her for the first time. We have not been formally introduced. I am Aetinos Somai. Aetinos looked mildly disappointed at Kasai. Ever, hero, where are your manners? Desdemonia bowed to Aetinos in a formal greeting. I am Desdemonia Mishi, from the villas of Shrizi, south of the Sarabi Pass. It is an honor to meet you, Master Aetinos. Shrizi, Shrizi, hmm... Aetinos thought for a moment, then. You are Sunis! Aetinos exclaimed in a proud voice as if he had solved a great riddle. Desdemonia shot a puzzling look at Kasai. Yes, Master Aetinos, I am from soon. She then became more insistent. Do you know a way back to Barokia? Will we be traveling through the Chaos Gate? Time grows short. She looked around the barren tundra, wary of the approach of enemies. Aetinos was perplexed. You don't need me. The ever here walks with you. Aetinus grabbed a generous handful of Kasai's shoulder and squeezed with brotherly familiarity. He knows what to do. He shall guide you home. Aetinus looked into Kasai's eyes and nodded, searching for understanding and agreement. Kasai slowly nodded back, although he had no idea why. See? There. It's settled. Aetinus once again wore a broad grin, as if everything was now just as it was supposed to be. The companions stood like lifeless statues in the cold wind. Kasai couldn't believe what he was hearing. He wondered if this really was Aetinos or just another elaborate hallucination. My new friends, I thank you for your help. I feel just like a youngster. I hope to repay you in full one day, but for now I bid you good day, Aetinos said. He turned and headed in the direction of the Lone Tower, whistling a cheerful tune. The Kibukansai joined Kasai and Desdemonia. What is happening? Where does Master Aetinus go? Eris said. His eyes were wide with nervous anguish. Why does he not stay to save us? Does he mean for us to follow? Does he show a, a different way home? Orin said next. 
His eyes darted to the chaos gate and then to the departing monk. The two young warriors looked to Kasai for answers. Kasai stood dumbfounded for a long moment, then bounded after the great monk. Master, wait. That tower, you called it Furia Keep. It's Sekka's lair, isn't it? Kasai caught up with Atenos. He took hold of a bunch of the great monk's smaller chuck coat to stop him, but unhanded it quickly. Atenos stopped and gave Kasai a friendly backhanded flick on his chest. You know the landmarks of Gothos well. Have you come to join me? Atenos seemed to remember some event and chuckled to himself. Then his expression turned grim. I must rescue Illyria. He pointed his thumb over his shoulder to the chaos gate. Back there is your way home. Just say the magic words and enjoy the ride. Atenos resumed, walking towards the tower. Master Atenos, Illyria is in Barokia and awaiting our return. She was the one who sent us, Kasai shouted over the wind. But Atenos kept walking. Kasai ran to him again. Stop, stop. There is only sorrow where you go. Barokia, nonsense. Illyria's in there. Atenos gave a quick nod in the direction of Furia Keep. And there is where I go. He picked up his pace and marched purposefully to the tower. Kasai raced ahead of Atenos and stood in front of him, blocking his way. Master, it was Illyria who sent us to you. By what means, I am unsure. She insisted we rescue you. Kasai looked back to the others to join him. His companions came fast. Estimonia seemed baffled by the demigod, while the others just stared in silent uncertainty. Atonus tilted his head slightly as if waiting to hear more, but Kasai remained silent. And you have, my young friend. You have fulfilled your promise. See, you rescued me. I am free. Atonus opened his arms wide as if to prove he was no longer bound. Wait, did I not thank you sufficiently? Atonus looked questioning at Estimonia. Did I not? Yes, Master Atenos, you did thank us, Destimonia replied, a bit exasperated. Perfect. You have fulfilled your promise, and I have thanked you for your deed. All is balanced, and I shall be on my way. Atenos hummed a happy tune as he walked around Kasai. He's not well. He's lost his mind and cannot help us, Destimonia said, shaking her head. Kasai thought the same. Do not speak of what you do not know, Orin shot back with surprising rage. Orin, I meant no disrespect. You heard him as well as I. It's as if the plight of mortals no longer concerns him. Orin turned quickly on Destimonia. His short sword was in his hand and raised at her throat. Take it back, witch, or I will slice you. Orin's entire body shook, and tears quickly froze as they tried to roll down his cheeks. The long and arduous journey had broken the young man's spirit. Estimonia jumped back, and her eyes fled bright amber. Vermilion glowing runes rose from her back and swirled in the air behind her. Orange fire coalesced in her hands. Orin, put the sword away, or I will hurt you. Estimonia said in a tone more menacing than Kasai had ever heard. Des, stop! Kasai jumped in front of Estimonia. Palo, get Orin under control. Palo quickly had a hand on Orin's sword arm and pushed him away from Testimonia. She's cast a spell on him. You all saw it. Atenos is not himself due to her dark magic. Orin cried out. Kasai heard Orin, but his eyes were in Testimonia. Tess, calm down. What are you thinking? He searched Testimonia's burning eyes for answers. Then her body relaxed. I... I don't know, I just reacted. She took a deep breath. I'm fine now. My magic is stronger here, much stronger than in our realm. It's eager to flow and difficult to control. I don't understand this. Your magic comes from the living energy of the forest. There's nothing alive here. Kasai looked all around. Nothing. Eliminati magic flows directly from the elements of the nature, and chaos is the spark that sets nature in motion. In its purest form, the destructive force of chaos creates the building blocks of new life. Kasai was confused. He had thought he had learned much of the world from the books and scrolls at Ordu, but it appeared he was grossly mistaken. He opened his mouth to say as much, but she continued before he could speak. Think of rain. Does it fall in the same pattern, drop after drop? No, of course not. But does the water bring life to the forest? Yes. 
it is essential. Well, here, in this place of pure chaos, each raindrop is filled with the means to create oceans of life, however random. Ever, hero, should we follow? Paolo interrupted. Kasai saw the worry in the older man's eyes. Aetinus is abandoning us. Eris's voice quivered with fear, and his shoulders slumped with defeat. We'll be trapped here, Oren said. He had regained some of his composure, but his mood was still hostile. Kasai knew everyone was counting on him to lead them to safety. He peered at the Chaos Gate with reservation. Aetinus said to use the Chaos Gate, but I do not know any magic words to activate it or how it works. Des? She shook her head. Where is Illyria? Kasai wondered. He concentrated on her image and called to her in his mind. Nothing. Kasai heard only the howling wind. He looked to see what progress Aetinus had made in reaching the tower. They could still catch him if they hurried. What choice did they have but to follow the great monk? Aetinus stopped abruptly and turned in the snow back towards the companions. The great monk shouted something over the swirling winds and waved to the party to catch up. I think he means for us to follow, Paolo said. Let's go. Master Aetinus is still the key. We need to help him regain his identity. Kasai said and looked specifically at Orn. He needs all of us. Yes, ever hero. Forgive me, I misspoke, Orin said, then bowed to Desdemonia. There will be time for apologies later, Orin, she said with a bit of a hard smile. Now we must catch ourselves a wayward monk. The first one to the demigod wins the prize, and she ran after Aetinus. Kasai was next, followed by the others. He tried his best to remain calm, even though the situation had worsened as the towering height of Furia Keep loomed overhead. 8. Sekka Sekka stood at the edge of a great, bold depression of ice. She eyed the bounty before her with human eyes and a well-deserved sense of satisfaction. Her planning and scheming had borne its first delicious fruit. A thousand living humans stared up at Seca as her alabaster hair whipped madly in the turbulent winds of Gothos. The archdevil was clad in a form-fitting bodice and leggings made from the skins of slaves. The organic material had been dyed indigo with thick stitching of black leather, which stood in stark contrast to her billowing white tresses. Black sigils of abyssal power danced and mingled within the pale strands of her hair like playful birds. Aishmara stood rigid to her right, wearing her soft hunting armor. The tan leather was the color of dark gold and deep rose. Arcane runes of protection graced its worn surface. Her hands silently caressed the handles of her double-bladed daggers. The vizen, warlord, and youngest sister of the brood, had been commanded by Seca to ensure the flow of souls to Gothos was uninterrupted. This is a promising start. The suffering of a thousand souls shall be a welcome addition to the ranks of my Frost Legion, Seca mused. Aishbara nodded at the recognition. My queen, the humans were easily corralled, and many came willingly, thinking greater plunder awaited them. Seca hungrily gazed down at the first bounty brought through the Chaos Gate. They were members of the northern barbarian tribes, who had rallied under the war banner of Maugris. The barbarians were promised slaves and riches in return for their swords and spears against the king's army of Barokia. Those who were not killed in battle or by her demon horde after the fall of Oziax had fled the battlefield, but remained to loot the poor border villages before returning home. That was where Shbara's soul hunters had captured them. It was an easy march back through the ruins of Raklak Fortress and to the living portal of the Chaos Gate. The humans huddled tightly together, shivering in their spiked armor and war helms, which sprouted curled animal horns. The thick furs they wore did nothing to protect them from the frigid cold of fear. The bravado the barbarians once exhibited on the battlefield, surrounded by demon allies, had turned to numbing terror. Even still, some bowed in acquiescence and reverence to their goddess. Good, she thought. Suffering came in many different forms, and she could use them all. You see, Ashmara, love and fear are the same. 
As the immortal mother is fond of saying, the balance must remain. Aishmara remained stoic. Her stormy eyes stared unblinking at the mass of captives. Bring up the orthods, Seka called out to her beast handlers, farther back from the edge of the pit. Cruel forms slithered and skittered across the eyes on stubby talon-shaped appendages extending from the sides of their bodies. The handlers viciously poked at the giant grub's rigid and bloated thoraxes, directing the sluggish creatures into position around the rim of the depression. The Orthod's upper bodies were fashioned like a mantis from the mortal realm. Each of the demons had a pair of three-sectioned arms encased in a hard shell. With the end section folded back over the middle, it resembled serrated scissors, which opened and closed menacingly in the cold air. Their heads were shaped like triangular helmets, composed of overlapping plated shells, ending in a stubbed beak for a mouth. The beast handlers eagerly awaited Seca's orders, as the orthos cooed and screeched in anticipation of their feast. Ashmara, you have done well. You were thoughtful to bring me an early taste of victory from the mortal realm. I am pleased with the rich bounty before me, but I must have more, much more. You honor me, my mistress. I wish to present the first harvest to you myself. Thy or scours the land leading to the mountain past of soon. I suspect when I return to him he will have more human souls to add to your banquet. You are a clever opportunist, Ashmara bowed. I wish only to serve the great Seka, and dare to hope she sees value in my deeds. Seka was not fooled by the pleasantries or professed loyalties of Ashmara. The warlord was as cunning as she was deadly. The Sariba Pass must remain open. I suspect treachery soon from our allies in Barokia. If the pass falls, I shall hold you and your warlock brother personally responsible. I must have unfettered access to soon. Is that clear? Seka's eyes bore into Ashmara's. That sulking and brooding brother of mine shall be more than capable of holding the pass. His magic is strong. The soul harvest will not cease, Ashmara said with a clear understanding of Seka's unveiled threat. Ensure that it does not. Your existence depends on it, Seka said. Yes, my mistress, I shall return to supervise the next harvest. Hold for a moment. Let us enjoy the suffering of your diligent work. Seka gave a slight nod to the lead beast handler, who yelled out a command to his group. The orthods along the rim of the wide depression slid down the slick surface. The giant malformed demons barreled into the barbarians with their bulbous bodies and chitin-plated limbs. Sharp, scythe-like appendages swept through the air, slicing and cleaving human flesh. Heads, arms, and legs tumbled through the air. Red mist rose from the depression as the screams of the captives added to the swirling howls of the barren environment. Seka could feel the raw power coursing through her blood as her infernal body soaked up the soul energy of the dead and dying. The black sigils dancing about her hair swirled like a cyclone above her head. A sigh of bliss escaped her full blue lips. Lord Arsiax, Seka called to her revived warlord, tell me, why is Sisfander still a thorn in my sight? Aishmara chuckled beneath her breath at the slight to the once esteemed warlord's pride. Ossiax's coarse hair bristled over his human form as the demon lord walked to the edge of the pit and stood to the left of Seka. He was in human form and dressed in thin, bleached white armor, composed of the bones of his defeated enemies. He glared menacingly at Aishmara. My queen, as we have discussed, the upstart says Fander, has aligned himself to a shadow patron, who swells the ranks of his armies and grants him clandestine passage through the abyss. And who is this mysterious and most beneficial shadow patron that aids my foes and thwarts my plans? Seka's voice dripped with soft kindness, as if he was coddling a child. I do not know. Why not? 
Her voice boomed over the screaming and dying barbarians. The orthods had begun to feast in earnest on the mayhem they had wrought. Why have you not unraveled this simple riddle for me? Have I not granted you every opportunity to redeem yourself? Yes, my queen. Osex dropped to a knee and bowed before Sekna. Allow me to lead your new host and stop his fander. He shall never reach Furia Keep. Ah, at long last. The mighty Osex grovels for forgiveness and favor. <laughs> Ashmara laughed out the words. You dare, Osex growled. Ashmara, please, it is not becoming of you to tease. Leave poor Osex alone. He has suffered much, Seka said in a playful tone. The words were a honey-coated bee sting. I am sorry, my mistress. The vision addressed Lord Osiax directly. I apologize for my hard words. But tell me, Lord Osiax, where is the boy who so easily took your head? I should like to congratulate him on such an impressive victory. Osiax stood in a flash and throttled Ashmara with his powerful hands. He raised her off the ground and held her in the air. Your existence ends now. Ashmara remained unfaced. She held both her double daggers at Osiak's neck, their blades already drawing blood. Release me now, or lose your head a second time, Ashmara threatened through clenched teeth. Osiak, release her, Seka commanded. Osiak dropped Ashmara to the ground. She landed like a cat, ready to strike again if necessary. Now, if you are finished, I would like to hear your assessment of our remaining troops here on Gathas, and what should be added from the soul energy of our barbarian guests. Osiax regained his composure and turned to Seka. He ignored the blood flowing down his neck and rolling down the bones of his white armor. My queen, says Fander has amassed a great hoard, but it is stocked with inferior soldiers. Minor fire demons and ash fiends make up the bulk of his ranks. He uses their vast numbers to overwhelm those who stand in his way. They would fall against the great behemoth of the ice, Lord Osiax bowed. I will march out with the might of a mountain and destroy the upstart once and for all. Ashmara, what is your opinion of Lord Osiax's strategy? While a single behemoth is of great power, it is slow and dim-witted. A division of Sesfander's horde can easily preoccupy it, while the rest of his troops flanks its sides and continue to fury a keep. Lord Arceax's winner-takes-all strategy is short-sighted and ill-conceived. It is a poor attempt to regain his lost prominence in your eyes. You will need to strike with speed and precision at the most vulnerable points of the foe's army to cripple the advance of his troops. This will provide the time necessary to replenish the Frost Legion. I agree with your assessment, Ashmara. You show promise as a keen strategist and powerful addition to the Frost Legion, perhaps even as its new general. My queen, Osiax appeared stunned. I must lead the Frost Legion, as I have done for millennia. You shall remain outside the tower and supervise the flow of mortals into the Orthod pits. I am wasted there. Nonetheless, you shall do what you are told. My sentries will continue to harry Sisfander and delay the approach of his army. I will crush him once I have accumulated sufficient might. Gathos will burn! We will be trapped when Sisfander reaches Furia Keep. Silence! Seka struck Osiax with such force that the demon lord fell to the ground. Do not question me again. Your past service to me is all that keeps you from joining the barbarians in the pit. Ashmara burst into a fit of condescending laughter. <laughs> What hope do you think you have against the archdevil Sisfander when you were bested by a single mortal child? <laughs> Ashmara smirked with a wicked grin. You reek of failure. Osiak shook with rage as he turned to confront Ashmara. You vision are vermin, scurrying for the small scraps of my achievements. 
you and your miserable siblings, each of you less trustworthy than the next. My queen, grant me my request and let me destroy this pretender. Do not presume to threaten me, Asiax. Your time as the queen's champion has ended. The warlords of Vissen shall usher in a new age of dominance in Gathos and beyond. You are a relic from the past. You are unneeded and unnecessary. I shall hear no more of this bickering, Seca said. Lord Asiax, prepare the remainder of the Frost Legion. Where you are not feeding the Orthod pit, you shall protect the Chaos Gate at all costs. She could sense the Demon Lord's fury. It mattered not to her. She had stretched her influence far and thinned her legions across much of the abyss. She had meticulously calculated the number of troops she would need to hold off this fander until more human souls could be harvested. There would be just enough. Mistress, has the thought occurred to you that Sisfanda knew of your plans for the Chaos Gate long before its creation? Ashmara said. Impossible. You are sadly mistaken, Osiak scoffed. Few knew of such plans, Seka agreed. Lord Osiak and me from Garthos and Malgris. But Sisfander had plagued her well before the arrival of the great monk. The Red Devil was settling an old score, nothing more. An unnerving thought crossed her mind. Could Malgris have contacted another archdevil or a higher power out of frustration when she refused him? Information of this nature was a valuable currency in the abyss. Sirka turned her attention back to the pit. The beast handlers had removed the orthots, and it was time to release the soul energy she had collected. Her open hands caressed the air, while her fingers traced delicate patterns above the bits and pieces of cleaved flesh and broken armor in the pit. Large piles of debris coalesced into odd forms, comprised of multiple limbs and protruding horns and spikes. Hulking flesh golems rose from the charnel remains of the pit. The golems no longer resembled the individual humans they had once been, for now they were an Amalgamation of armor, horns, fur, and flesh. Eyes open, teeth chattered in random locations across their bodies. That should be enough to ward off this fander if he attempts to storm the keep. Our walls are strong and easily manned. Lord Oziax, take them to the tower's outer gate and hold there until I give further instruction. I will triple our efforts in the mortal realm and have a swift return, Ashmara proclaimed. My mistress... With your leave, I shall depart. Seca waved her away. Her thoughts drifted to the dungeons buried deep in Furia Keep. The time had come to finally solve the riddle of Sisfander's shadow patron. Seca entered Baugris' dank prison cell. The once powerful sorcerer wedged himself into the corner of the small room. He was collared by an iron band connected to a thick chain, which continued through the ice floor. His arms were bound behind his back by rough ropes that bit into his pallid skin. A gag and full mouthpiece prevented him from speaking. It was merely a precaution against any spells he may have hidden away before she made him a prisoner of Gothos. He was known for his cunning contingency plans. Seca looked down at the frail man and sighed with contentment. Margris flinched at the sight of her, but he quickly regained his haughty demeanor. He posed no threat to her now, especially here. She ripped the gag from his face. His eyes were defiant and held an unwillingness to accept he had been duped. Seca laughed to herself. Such were the shortcomings of mortals. Chidipa tells me you heal quickly, even after her most savage attentions. You have quite an impressive constitution. Get out, Maugris said as if he still ruled over her actions. But his commanding attitude was short-lived. He turned away, deflated. You often spoke of Sisfander in Raklak Fortress. Seca spoke in a casual and friendly manner. She toyed with a loose chain hanging from the wall, stroking its length and, and lightly swinging it to the side. Did the Red Devil ever answer your call? Baugris laughed. What's this now? Do you come for tea? 
You should have killed me long ago. Every day I am alive is another day I plot my revenge. It will be me that delivers you to your doom. Surely I would expect no less. Now tell me of your conversations. She said and bent down and traced her long nails up and across Maurice's face, stopping just before his eye. Her fingernail drew blood from his lower eyelid. His arrogance was always a blind weakness, and she hoped he would take the bait. What is there to say that you don't already know? The Red Devil comes and comes fast. Soon Furia keeps you burn, and all of Gathos will melt beneath the inferno of his rage. He has not the might of arms to storm my keep. My defenses are too strong within the tower. The brash upstart knows this and will not engage me directly, not here. The Red Devil is not alone. Maugus glared defiantly into her eyes and then chuckled with satisfaction. <laughs> and you still do not know. Sekka's hunch proved accurate. Maugus had been in contact with other powerful denizens of the Abyss, whether he spoke directly to Zisfander or lesser demons willing to divulge their secrets was unknown. It was clear he had information that her spies and sentries could not provide. I realize I may have underestimated you and offer you a bargain of sorts. What game do you play with me? You shall tell me everything you know, and if it proves worthy of my interest, I will release you from your pain. Malgris gazed at Sekka with uncertainty. Then he burst out laughing. <laughs> you will then kill me, if that is your wish. Or perhaps I can find a place for you in the Frost Legion. A mage of your talent is not carelessly thrown away. Maurus stopped laughing. He stared silent daggers back at her. His silence spoke of a fear Sek had felt with increasing unease. A more sinister game was afoot, and willingly or not, she was a playing piece, moved by another's hand. Just then, she received a mental message from a sentry posted on the outskirts of the wasteland of Thresh. She turned away from the penetrating eyes of Maugris. What do you mean? The flesh golems are gone? Gone where? Sekka mistakenly spoke aloud into the air. My queen, Lord Asiax, took the recruits through the gates of the tower. He marched across the wastelands to confront Sisvander. All of them? Yes, my queen. Sekka turned her thoughts to Lord Osiax. Her rage boiled. Osiax, what have you done? Answer me. There was only silence. Sekka focused her will into the mind of Osiax and established a connection. She saw the blurry terrain through Osiax's eyes. Pale, bone-armored boots stomped hurriedly on the white ground. She heard labored breathing over the crunching snow. She forced Osiax's head to swivel around and take in more of his surroundings. The new golem horde had been decimated. But few numbers remained, raced back to Furia Keep in full retreat. Sekka could only assume Sis Fander's horde was close behind and would soon overtake them. Sekka felt Maurice's eyes on her. He wore a smug grin. You are already doomed, Maurice said. He slid back against the wall. Doomed. Nine. Kasai. Kasai, Deaths, and the others took a momentary break to catch their breath before they resumed chasing after Athanos. A sharp wind-swept flurry of snow blew across the smooth surface of the lake of ice before them. Athanos had not hesitated to cross and bounded forward with great haste. The demigod ran like a man sprinting the last league of a grueling marathon, obsessed as he was with reaching Furia Keep. His pace was locked, but his steps occasionally faltered on his unsure and exhausted footing. His strength is returning, Hallow commented, between deep gulps of air. His body folded forward with his hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath. Perhaps in body, but not in mind, Eris said. He too was panting. He races to Sekka's lair without care. Illyria is not there. 
The young warrior stated aloud what everyone in the small party knew as well. And we blindly follow? His memory will return. Until then, you will find your courage and complete the quest. Palo tilted his head up to look Eris in the eyes. His tone was reprimanding, yet patient. The wood witch was right. The master is not well, Eris said to the group. Orin glared daggers at Eris and shook his head in disgust. Do not listen to her, Eris. She is not one of us. Eris' expression was grim. He turned to each of them and then grabbed Kasai by the arm to make his point. His eyes were wide and wild. We will not survive this. Kasai understood how he felt. Fear soaked through everything here. It was thick and suffocating and coiled around his spine. Kasai felt it in cold, prickly sweat that formed between his skin and clothing he wore. The Kibuk and Sai were just men relying on their faith to sustain them through such an insane trial. Estimonia had no such conviction. She relied on her magic, at least that was the act she was playing. Kasai observed the vibrant greens of her aura, fading to sickly, dirty yellow hues. His companions had come willingly on this quest. However, none of them could have known what to expect, or the despair that awaited them on Gothos. He had to find a way to pierce the thick fog clouding Aetanos's mind, or they would all go mad. Kasai could talk some sense into him if he would just stay still long enough. Kasai peered into the distance. Aetanos had pulled farther ahead of the group. Come, we must not dally for too long, or we will lose the master to the snow. Kasai and the others ran across the lake in pursuit of Aetanos. Up ahead, he noticed blurry shapes moving erratically at the frozen lake's surface. They all slowed their pace when they saw the exposed bodies held fast in the ice. Some were trapped at the waist and twisted one way and then the next, trying to escape. Others were submerged up to their heads or higher. A few had managed to free their bodies but could not unlock their feet from the ice. They frantically pounded on the ice surface, hoping it might break. Small hair-covered wardens with stubby arms and legs held long poles ending in trident points. The dwarf-like creatures stabbed at the flailing bodies until other larger fiends came by and dropped a glowing yellow orb onto the ice next to the condemned soul. Relief turned to dismay as the ice around the victim turned to slush and the condemned soul sank deeper into the frigid water. Then the slush froze, trapping the soul anew. Aetanus raced past them, scurrying the wardens out of his way. Kasai was shocked the demigod did nothing to help the suffering souls trapped in the ice. But what was there to do? These souls were here for a reason, weren't they? Kasai surveyed the ground carefully for fear of tripping over the heads locked in the ice. He jumped over a group of souls frozen up to their noses. They stared wide-eyed as he and his companions ran past. They zigzagged past the bodies whose chests were above the ice and reached for them with their grabbing hands. Dark-colored eels slithering below the ice's surface had gorged themselves on the soul's submerged flesh. The condemned screamed in agony unless their mouths were frozen under the ice. Aetanos had stopped and appeared unsure of his surroundings. He spun slowly to the right, took a few steps and then turned to the left. Furia Keep loomed menacingly in the near distance, but seemed invisible to Aetanos. <sighs> Master Aetanos, Kasai said between breaths when he was close enough to be heard. Aetanos turned and his one eye squinted at Kasai with suspicion until recognition returned. Ah, it's you again. Hello. The others caught up and gathered around. Are these your friends? Aetanos nodded to each of Kasai's companions, and he bowed to Desdemon. Hello, I am Aetanos Sumai. May I assist you in any way? Desdemonia looked questioningly at Kasai before she gave her a short bow in return. Hello, Master Aetanos. I am Desdemonia. Well met, Desdemonia. You look familiar. Have we met? It's doubtful I would forget a beauty such as yours. Aetanos curiously raised his eyebrow, waiting for an answer. When none came, he casually looked about until he saw Furia keep. That's odd. When did that get there? Aetanos put his index finger to his lips and remained in deep thought. Master Aetanos, who are these people? Why are they trapped here? Is there a way to save them? He looked at Kasai as if seeing him for the first time, and then realized he had been asked a question. Hmm? Can these people not be saved? 
Aetonos looked over the frozen lake of the prisoners trapped there for eternity, his one eye saddened. Ah, yes, I see. Well, no, they are beyond salvation, but worry not. They are no longer people as you see them, for their mortal bodies died long ago. They are phantoms now. Residual consciousnesses of damned souls are all that remain. They suffer eternity being tormented by whatever punishment was sentenced to them for their actions in life. By the light of Aetonus, what could they have done to deserve such torture until the end of all things? Paolo said as he moved cautiously around a thrashing soul. He looked questioningly at Aetonus for an answer, at realizing the scripture he had just quoted in the demigod's name. And who is so worthy of condemning a soul for all eternity? Why has the immortal mother passed such judgment and punishment? Testimonia said with disapproval. Run Run exchanged a nervous glance with his brother. Eris and Orn mumbled troubled words to each other and pressed two fingers to their respective foreheads. The immortal mother is above such actions. She is the creator of all things and holds all her children in the great balance. It is not her will that sentences these lost souls. Who then? Testimonia would not relent. Who is so above the actions of all living beings and can judge them fairly? Whatever their transgressions, these souls have been forgotten. Yet their torment endures. Oh, ho, oh, I see you have passion in your heart. Aetonus nudged Kasai in the side. Her fire burns bright. Des, maybe now is not the right time for this, Kasai said. There is always time for now, Aetonus said playfully. Because I remember the time when Master Shogar had said the same thing to him. He wished Master Shogar was here now. He longed for his dead master's advice. Master Aetonus, we must return to Barokia. Illyria is there waiting for you. She's not on Gothels and not in the dungeons of Furia Keep, because I said. Furia Keep? Yes! My Illyria! Thank you for reminding me, my friend. Aetonus then darted forward and ran once more to Furia Keep. He still didn't answer me, Des said as she stomped past Kasai and ran after Aetonos. It wasn't long before Aetonos reached the base of the tower. He peered over a snowdrift, assessing their next move. I present to you the entrance of Furia Keep and the lair of Seca of Gothos. He patted the air with his hand. Best to speak in whispers. We don't want anyone to hear our secret plans. Ranron looked about and then... Signed questioningly to his brother with quick hands. Paolo shrugged his shoulders. I know, Run Run. There is no one about. Where are the guards? Or patrols or, or anything? Something is wrong here, Paris said, looking desperately at Kasai. We are walking into a trap. They are already trapped, Iris. Only on the outside, Orin said. The ice and snow cover everything. If there is a door, it's not here. Master Aetonus, return with us to the Chaos Gate. Illyria waits for you in Barokia. Please listen to reason. We were sent here to return you to her. Illyria. Aetonus paused. I knew an Illyria once. She was my special angel. He sat back heavy in the snowdrift. It was so very long ago. Yes, great one. She waits for you in Barokia, south of the Hoarfrost Mountains. Come with us and be reunited, Orin pleaded. Aetonus jumped to his feet. I remember now. You are the ever-hero. Aetonus thrust his hand out for Kasai to take in partnership. You must join me in rescuing my beloved. It shall be a grand quest worthy of the ages. Master Aetonus, Illyria is not there. Kasai spoke slowly and calmly. The lower portion of the tower's surface broke away from the rest in an ear-shattering pop of eyes. Kasai could now see the outline of two massive gates where moments before there were only stone and snow. Slowly the doors were pushed open from within by two hulking creatures covered in white fur. Look at the size of those beasts! Eris exclaimed. Eris, be still! Paolo spoke in a hushed voice. They look like Taji Dew Bears! From the upper reaches of northern Trosk, Orin said in awe. Run Run nodded with enthusiasm while putting his arms high up in the air for Paolo to see. Yes, Orin has the right of it, Paolo said. They are Jolgoths, Aetonus said, 
and counted two fingers on his hand. Where are all the others hiding, I wonder? Hmm. Aetona scuffled over to her oar and sat against the snowbank. You see, one can always find a way when one looks closely and has a bit of luck. Aetona winked at Orin and turned to the rest of the group. Remove what is deemed impossible and search through what remains. There you will find the possible. Or is it the other way around? Athos then stood straight up and shook the snow and ice from his smaller chuck fur. Well then, my angel awaits. Master Athos, please get down. Kasai grabbed him by his coat and hauled him down. The great monk was like an unaware child who thought everything was a toy to play with or examine without pause or concern. A war song bellowed from inside the tower. Kibo Kasai pressed in close to the snowbank, and Desdemonia crouched down next to Kasai. Master Aetinos squatted down as well, mimicking the others for fun. There was mischief in his one remaining eye as it darted back and forth, and an eager smile across his face. What do you think is coming out of that gate? Aetinos said with excited wonder. Kasai couldn't tell if he was asking because he was ready to do battle, or just enjoying the surprise. Kasai sighed. He remembered how Master Shogar spoke with such calm ease during their escape from Ordu. Never once did Master Shogar show fear or worry while fleeing for their lives. Yes, I wondered what it took to face danger with such tranquility. You remind me of Master Shogar. Who do you think taught that old rascal? Aetinos made an exaggerated gesture of pointing his thumb at himself. And Dorian Kunshin too. You taught the three masters of Ordu? But your song has not been heard for over a hundred years. Kasai quickly regretted speaking so plainly. However, he wondered at the sanity of the great monk. Was I gone that long? It seemed like only a blink and a yawn, Aetna said and shrugged his shoulders. One must understand, time moves differently in each of the three realms. Is that why you were gone for so long? You simply lost track of time? Ares said incredulously. We endured so much suffering simply because you forgot about us? Paolo cuffed the young warrior. Ares! Know your place. Aetinos does not need to explain his actions to you. Aetinos drifted off in a trance. My message was heard on the late summer breezes, and in the smell of the first winter snow. It could be felt in the cool spring thaw, and seen as a colorful rain of autumn leaves. I have always been close to those with open hearts and open minds. Aetonos turned to Iris, and there was a kindness in his voice when he spoke. Do not feel angst, Iris. There is a natural flow to all things, no matter the hardship or the pain. The immortal mother keeps all in her perfect balance. All is as it should be, even now for you. Iris slumped into the snowdrift, looking more confused than when Aetonos first spoke. But you will set things right. You will restore the balance, won't you? Aetonos pointed his finger repeatedly at Kasai. Your answer is sitting right there, my young friend. Eris looked away, clearly disappointed. His faith in Kasai was low. Orin moved closer to Eris and rested a reassuring hand on the young warrior's shoulder. It will be all right, you'll see. Eris just looked away. His body shook beyond the effects of the cold. Even Desdemonia looked despondent as she gazed nervously towards the tower's open gates. Kasai knew he should say something to lift the spirits of his companions. But what was there to say? Kasai's thoughts were interrupted by the sound of howls and deep drum beats. A large quadruped and rider lumbered out from the open gates. Its body was covered in interlocking plates that resembled the hard shell of a river turtle. A viscous, metallic green slime oozed out of crusty fist-sized barnacles along its side and flowed down the mount's long flanks. Its broad paws kicked up snow and ice as it plodded forward. Six human slaves with arm-sized hooks dug into their backs and protruding out their chests, dangled from chains attached to six long poles mounted at the beast's side. The slaves swung mercilessly against the steps of the lumbering mount, crying out in pain as the hooks ripped through their bodies. The rider was covered in bone-like armor. His head was completely enclosed in a tall helm, graced by two twisted horns that reminded Kasai of the magnificent antlers of mountain force stags. 
Behind the rider came creatures out of nightmares. The flesh golem stood upright and slogged awkwardly on two legs. The bodies were humanoid in appearance, but twisted and corrupted by dark magic. Mismatched animal fur covered much of their bodies, but where it did not reach, their flesh was protected beneath random pieces of armor. Clusters of human eyes rolled in opposite directions, and malformed mouths exposed chattering teeth. The arms of the flesh golems ended in curled and serrated iron. Their weapons clanged together and added an eerie melody to the raucous march. The line of demons followed the antler-helmed rider out into the frozen wasteland. The two Jogoths followed the procession past where Kasai and the others huddled against the snowbank. The brutes watched with indifference as the swirling winds and blinding snow consumed the war party. Oh, ho, oh, now is our chance. We can sneak in like little mice. Hop, hop, hop. Aetan of Sedan moved his hands like small animals scurrying over the snow. Ready? Kasai was not sure how to respond. He felt the incessant weigh heavy at his side. The ancient artifact pulsed a need into his mind. Kasai assumed the weapon wanted to stay with the master, for only his divine might could fully unleash the vast potential of the ancient artifact. Master, wait. Forgive me for not mentioning this earlier. I have Ninza Zida. I believe she wishes to return to you, and I would do so before we enter the tower. Aetanus looked down at the weapon. Ah, there's a pretty thing. His hand moved lovingly along the staff's three black segments. Vapors of heat radiated from the surface of the weapon in response to his touch. Kasai sensed the deep connection between Ninza's Sida and Aetanos. It was a bond that would never be broken, as if the two were two separate pieces made whole. Aetanos nodded once, and a smile came to his face. He then slowly pushed the weapon back towards Kasai. No, my son, she wishes to remain with you. Kasai was dumbfounded. He looked down at Ninza's Sida and bowed in respect. The fire serpent blazed brightly in his hands. He wanted to believe he was worthy of such an honor. Then Aetanus clapped his hands together and hopped and danced behind the snowbank. Come, come, the parade has finished, and it's our time to skitter and steal like little mice beneath the lazy eyes of the sleepy cat. Master, wait. We're just going to walk in the front entrance? Because I look baffled. <laughs> Why not? No one inside really expects visitors. It's getting out that will prove difficult. Aetanos gave Kasai a knowing wink, then leaped over the snowbank and raced through the open doors of the tower gate. We're doomed, Eris said. He lay back in the snow, defeated. Nonsense. Up you go. The chase remains. The price has doubled, since we now know he's crazy, Testimonia said in a cheery voice. She nodded in the direction of where Aetanos had disappeared inside Furia Key, playfully elbowed Kasai in the arm. Remind you of anyone? She laughed as she leaped over the snowbank and followed Aetanos into the tower. Kasai shook his head in wonder. Just like that, the frolicking gypsy was back without a care in the world. She is an interesting one, Paolo said. His eyes looked to the tower with foreboding. And fearless. Come, ever hero. We will need your strength. Run Run was already up, ready to follow Kasai's lead. She will ruin us all, Orin said. Kasai looked down at Iris, who seemed to have sunk deeper into the snow. Iris, we must go. Why? We cannot hope to succeed. The witch is right. Aetanus has lost his mind. Iris, Orin said, mind your tongue. I will not. Iris, we will help him find his way back. You'll see, Kasai said, but until we do, we will need your blades and your faith. Eris stared at Kasai for a long moment. Illyria chose you. I was there and saw it with my own eyes. My faith in Aetanos may be lost, but I will hold my faith with you. Kasai extended his hand for Eris to grasp. Eris rose and brushed the snow from his clothing. I follow the will of the Argent Hammer. Do not abandon hope, Iris, nor your faith in the light. Both will keep you safe. Do you really think we will get home? I don't know, but we must keep trying. Thank you, Arrow Hero, 
forgive me, your courage will be my courage. Kasai put his hand on Ida's shoulder and turned to Palo, Orin, and Run Run. It's all any of us can do. He then leaped over the snowbank and followed after Aetanos and Desdemonia. The Kibo Gansai followed closely behind. They soon regrouped and stayed close to the ice wall within the courtyard of the tower. Bodies of the condemned were encased in ice and frozen in grisly gestures, many with open mouths, as if caught mid-scream before being frozen solid. Their bodies rose up the wall to unseen heights. Kasai was astounded by the impossible size of the courtyard. The exterior of the tower could not possibly hold such a vast interior. The height of the tower seemed to extend forever. It was a world within a world. Master Aetanus, how will we find our way through such a place? Kasai said as he craned his neck upwards. Aetanus placed his hand on the back of Kasai's head and tilted it downward. First, we look in the right direction. We go down. These statues look so lifelike, Aerith said. He put his hand out to touch the nearest one. I wouldn't touch that if I were you, Aetanus said, and Aerith quickly withdrew his hand. Orin, you and Aerith will mind the entrance, Powell said, as he too looked curiously at the statues. Run, run, see if your keen eyes can help Master Aetanus in any way. Run, run nodded and sided up to Aetanus and Kasai. Statues look wet, Desdemonia said, as she backed away from the wall. The ice is melting. Something is happening. We work quickly with slow and careful hands, Aetanos said, and moved his hands along the wall, using his fingers to search along the cracks and fissures. Kasai, they're alive, Desdemonia gasped. Told you not to touch them, Aetanos said. The eyes sloughed off the heads of bodies and slid down to the floor. The eyelids of the condemned flashed open and stared wide-eyed at the party. Then they screamed. Not good, not good, Palo said, as he and Run Run drew their swords. The shrieking chorus of damned grew louder as more of the condemned souls thawed from their frozen hibernation. Orn and Eris backed away quickly from the sides of the entrance and drew their weapons. The Jolgots raced through the open doors and snarled with moss filled with gleaming needle-shaped teeth. The wailing souls trapped in their icy shrouds turned their sorrowful cries to malicious and mocking laughter. Master Aetanos, Kasai said. He grabbed Linz's Sita from his sash and held her three segments tightly together in one hand. The Stemonia conjured her magic and the air smelt of autumn's dry leaves and moist soil. It's here somewhere, I'm sure of it. Aetanus said, and mumbled some other words Kasai could not understand. Master! Kasai shouted. Mm. Yes? Aetanus looked over his shoulder at the approaching Jorgoths. Their mangy fur bristled as pinkish snakes rose from their backs. Not so sneaky mice after all. See to them, would you? I really must concentrate. He waved away the Jorgoths as if they were a simple nuisance, and returned to feeling the surface of the wall. Before Kasai could say another word, the white fur demons were upon them. 